Hello everyone! And I'm hoping, he says, that that is working. Sorry, I just realised I was doing something else earlier today. Oof. And apologies, because this was originally supposed to be out on the 23rd of March. It ended up going out on 25th of March because, well, I ate my sister's cooking. I love her dearly, but I ate her cooking. And apologies. But, one of the interesting things that has happened to me, and there's a lot has happened to me since actually I've been ill, is um, I learnt again... The importance and why I am so thankful for all this YouTube stuff. Why am I so thankful for all your support? Because it's become a bit of a running joke. It's such a running joke that some people occasionally, I think, think I'm making it up. Um, how university pay can be random and can be strange. Well, this month, instead of receiving any pay from one of my employers, I received a tax back because they'd overtaxed me from last month. So instead of actually giving me pay for all the hours I did, because you pay get paid a month in arrears. So instead of getting paid the hours for what I did in February, I have been given the tax back on the, uh, the money back that they deducted as too much tax on my pay in January. I've having conversations with this university, but um, let's put it this way. And before anyone sort of sort of think of this is you know this is them being you know, an actual conversation I've had with this university employer went like, well, you're a contract lecturer. I'm sure you have other contracts with other universities, so. We don't need to, we'll pay, we'll put this money into next, we'll put the money we owe you into next month's paycheck. Excuse me? Now, thankfully, I have all of you, and I do have a couple of other small contracts. So, I'm not destitute this month, and I live at home, and my very kind mum has basically gone, well, you'll share the bills, I'll cover this month until you get paid. And I can afford to do that at this moment, but when I used to live on my own, I definitely couldn't afford to live, do that. And I really shouldn't have to afford to do this now, because my boss has signed off on my pay slips. The person who's my line manager. My boss's boss has signed off on my pay slips. But they've forgotten to be moved through. They weren't moved through in time. I submitted them early enough in a month. My bosses and the various levels submitted them early enough in a month. But they got delayed due to illness, etc. And so they weren't paid through. So a whole raft of people like me in the university. Some people who do not have the benefits of a YouTube channel. Some people who do not have the benefits of all the other stuff. The book and all the other things I have. Which are little bits and dribs of money. Which will keep me going. They don't have that. So, yeah. I know this is off the topic for the blockading breast industry. But it was just round home why I should say thank you again to all of you. So when I say thank you, I know some people sometimes think that, you know, it's just something YouTubers say, and I don't, I can't speak for everyone else, but for me, I really do mean it. Because, um, basically, I'm two grand short this month in pay. Yes, I am being serious before anyone... That is what I'm thinking about this two grand and the whole system by the way is automated for those people who are answering question um, It's a case of uh, The there are it's automated, but people are supposed to tick it at various points. So yes, they didn't <sighs> Fun times fun times hello nice to take from uh, there, uh, there will be um, the as scheduled Sorry, I'm just, just remember, whenever I mention the French or Spanish navies, I have the person who backs them up and supports them every time in Empire Total Wars sitting to my, uh, to my right. Um, yes, yeah, so there will be, there, there will be bilge pumps tomorrow, uh, no, brew ships tomorrow, and bilge pumps will come out tomorrow or Monday. 
because honestly, I meant it meant to come out on Friday, but I was just so ill I forgot I didn't upload it properly. And that's on me. But I was running between here and facilities. I've now had so much of the um <clears throat> let's put it this way. Uh I'm just gonna take another tablet before we start. I am basically surviving off liquids and tablets at the moment. Which is not a good combination, please tell uh, let me tell you, it's not a good not a sensible combination. Argus, I've been having, having YouTube trouble. Can anyone see this? Yes, I can see you. Hello, Mark. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carmen Gersberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Runon. Um, hello, John Newman. Hello, Night Heron Productions. Hello, Tanif Verka. Hello, DG40. Hello, Frame 15. I don't think I've seen you for a while. I may not have seen you before, actually. I'm not sure. I think there used to be a Frame. Hello, Bugguy8229. Hello, Mancha Dostal. Hello, Seneca Nero. Hello, Leslie Mitchell. And, uh, yeah. It's just, it's just fun. As I said, without you, without all of you, without the support I get from YouTube and this lot, I would be really, really snookered at the moment. Patron YouTube. Hmm. I've got frothy in my moustache. So, um, yeah. Hello, Wayne. Hello, George. Hello, um, Colin. Hello, Melanie. Hello, Carl. Hint, that university that you might, wa might want to mention. No, I, I'm not going to do that because that would be, um, honestly, you do that to one university, they'll all take it. Uh, they'll all uh, they'll all take it out on you, so you don't. How's your sister cooking that bad? Um, my mum had one piece of chicken. She has just got over it. I had four pieces of chicken. And, um, yeah. Oh, trust me, um... Uh, the, in my mum's defence, uh, she, she had the turn around and remind me that I am paying for the holiday, in, for her birthday holiday. So, yes. But she knows I'm good for that. Thank you, Aaron. I'm preparing for my drawing theory test money. Any tips on for retaining and studying? Um. Okay. I have got a video on the channel about revision studying, but basically the trick I was teaching my students is to read the section of the book with a question in mind, no more than three or four pages of any book, but in a driving theory test it's not going to be that big, and close the book and write down what you remember. Don't write down while you're reading the book, because then you'll just copy the stuff out, and then it doesn't go through your brain. But if you read with a question in mind, close the book and write down what you remember, the act of thinking, etc. will help you remember, and it's been proven to work. Away, and stop woofing yourself in the, win in the window. No! You're not going... It's the feral research assistant out there. You are not going out there to try and tell her what to do. Just because you're the fluffy research assistant and you've got an assistant doesn't mean you can tell the feral what to do. She's independent. Yes, she's independent. No, she's not under your control. Thank you, Nairon Brooks. Money always helps. Especially at the moment, as I said. Um, it's one of the interesting things, because at the same university I then had the conversation with, and they wasted money. Well, if you wrote more, but if you'd published more books, etc., and wrote more, we'd actually consider making you a, 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 a tenured a contract, a permanent member of staff on tenure. And I sort of go, how am I supposed to be writing and producing anything, while at the same time I constantly have, constantly have to do many, many, many jobs, because you forget to pay me. Cute. Anyway. I think the late pay was um, more annoying than the food poisoning in some regards. Hello. You've now appeared on this side. Okay. I have 
the, po the, 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 the poodle is deciding which side they want to come, uh, they want to be on. Um, they're now looking at me on the screen. Hello, History Vanguard. Hello, Nale. So, today's topic, blockading breast. It's always fun. And it is quite a fun topic to do. Mainly because... It's one of those scenarios. The re it's kind of like the reason why I gave it, I made it a, um, a, oh, what's it called? A premiere rather than a normal video launch. Because it's one of those topics which is entirely contextual. But it leads to this sort of skill, this mythology about British superiority at sea and naval strength and capabilities. Which is sort of earned, but also sort of not true. Because it's not some innate ability, it's not some innate greatness of British system, it's just the willingness to invest in the system because they had to. It's, it's the same reason as why did the British spend the money on copper bottling? Why do they spend the money on the wood system? Why do they spend the money they do on the dockyards and all the other things? Because they have to. You never get a political class to spend money unless they have to. And that's the scenario. Uh, Rapper is like, oh, the, your pay confuses me. They are only legally required to pay me. Pay. They are, but, um, you know, surely, surely, this is, this is a university. Surely everyone who works for us ha is independently wealthy and doesn't need the money. Hello, Abzotsky. Hello, Shane Stoney. Yeah. They're interesting on that one. Oh, and... Again, I know I've mentioned this already, but I am going to keep learning about this. I'm sending in corrections and some of the few things, but to make the second edition of this, because thanks to all you, enough of the copies of this have been booked and been bought that they're going to print a second edition. <clears throat> well, and sorry to jump into modern politics, but I'm going to give the example now. It's kind of like... When people start talking about spending in the British in Britain in terms of NATO defence, and they go, "We need a strong army to be part of, to be a good part of NATO," and you go, "So you've got the German army, the Polish army, which is even stronger. You've got the American army, you've got the French army. You've got all these massive armies, which are far bigger than the British are ever going to spend the money to make the British army." At what point? Sincerely, is a British army structured to go and fight in Poland really helpful to anyone? A British army which is structured to be an expeditionary force to be launched at the flanks to be mobilised behind an amphibious task group which will uh, carry a battle group which will cover the entrance, an amphibious task group which will take the landing area, and then an army division which will land wherever they need to be landed and will go storming in from the flanks. That's friggin' useful. That's going to be useful. But and putting together a decent combat division when you've got the Polish, the German, and all the other armies. It's just a case of, yeah. That's, that, that, that's not really going to matter much. In the scheme of things, it, it's nice. But there are... Other people who are going to put in a decent combat division, and it's probably going to be more integrated into those forces because, again, the other problem for them is that the British are going to insist on buying British equipment and doing a British mix. Whereas, if you look at most of the European armies, they are going for uh, either European mix or the American mix, depending on who they are. I was asking, so I got it. Someone actually shipped you a book to Poland. Cool! 
Um, do you know laser pig? Uh, I don't think so. Hello, Alice Ashore. Am I going on book tour? Um, I don't know. If if it's po if they want to, if they're happy to do it, then I I'd, I'd like to do at least a proper book launch party because I didn't manage to really get to do that one though because of COVID. So I would like to do one of those, um, and I probably will do. I, I, I'm not sure where I'll go because now I've had the honest conversation with my mum because her arthritis has got bad and gone. Where can you get? Where would you be happy getting to? Because if I did a book launch party, I'd like you to be there. And it's a case of, uh, well, I'd love it to be at King's, but I don't think I'd make it to King's because there'd be a lot of walking and I have to get upstairs or into lifts and things, etc. Okay. So I'm going to think about it. And if there's any interest and if the publishers are keen on it, then we'll do it. But I'll have to figure out where it'll be done. Oh, it's Rook's Foot. Hello. Um, unemployment is a one-way street. If you are late more than a few times, uh-oh. But if they are late or incorrect paying you, month after month, you're not supposed to moan. Mm-hmm. Colin Cameron, it's the same with uh, contracts for big, uh, for any sort of big co organisation. Some even demand a six-month payment period, so you're waiting half a year for, uh, if you're lucky. It's the interesting thing I've found. Um, with YouTube and... Patron, which are sort of fairly big organisations, and I would expect them to sort of be the ones who'd be mucking around. But no, I can count. They um, they might not always pay a massive amount, but they always pay exactly the right date, and you can un always understand the amount. Um, Britain, uh, Mark Harkness, Britain pays for a navy; they rent an army. This is the period where they really do begin to do that. Uh, Oh, goodness. British, uh, Seneca Nero, the British army should do the same thing with France as the Dutch army is doing with the German army. No. No one wants to do that with the, uh, the no one wants to do that between the British and the French armies. We really don't. In nicest way, we find the British army, uh, the British army is in, the British army is lovely and I have great deal of respect for them on an individual basis and as a group. But, occasionally, I, I have to admit and I love them dearly, the British Army can get very, very, very... How do I put this politely? Very obsessed with refighting World War II in Germany! They do it. They do it. They we're going to do it. And you sit there and go, and if they, you combine them with the French, that'll just get worse. Because both armies have that potential tendency. And all they'll do is they'll rebuild to fight it, refight World War II in Germany, and it won't be World War II in Germany. That is all that will happen. If you let those two armies fuse in any way, shape, or form, that is what will happen. Uh, basically, uh, what's going to happen in this one is because it's already been prepared, etc. The second edition is going to have all the corruption. It's going to have HMS Nubin in the in the in the table. All those sort of things in there. So it's going to be fixed. Basically, all the small little errors which managed to creep in at various points. Me and the wonderful editor senior editor, are going to go through and fix. Basically, we are fixing all the little issues. We are fixing them. It's not going to get much extra information added in. Uh, anything, basically they've said if I, uh, to, for a significant rewrite it would have to be the third edition. Joss Monk, NATO's interests aren't necessarily the same as membership interests. That's all I'm going to say about that. True. No, NATO is a broadly is an, an alliance which has a collective interests. That means it's not always going to be the same. I you do get slightly better royalties on the second edition, but not massively better. <laughs> um, I don't think the Czech Republic is getting Kaliningrad, Alzowski. I think if. Anyone gets him, it's probably going to be the Lithuanians or um, other of the Baltic states. Uh, 
I will do. Yeah, it's not good, and it got worse because, you see, before COVID, she used to come to the gym with me twice a week and exercise to keep her arthritis at bay. And then during COVID, of course, she had to stay in because she was with her asthma, one of the very at-risk people. So, yeah, her mobility has gone. We'll slowly work on that. Unless I'm dog sisters need cooking lessons. <laughs> what do you think? Does Sissy need cooking lessons? You've. Sh what I love is I mentioned your sister's cooking and your mouth goes shut. It's just—it's an instantaneous reaction from the dog. What are you doing? Where are you off to? Sorry, Poodle's down here at the moment. I'm not sure what he's doing or why he's down here, but he's down here. <sighs> oh, uh, uh, hello. Oh, that's what you wanted. Oh, hello. Right then. Can you set contracts to pay periodically or stuck with single, uh, single checks? Um... Uh, mostly they pay uh, quarterly in terms of books. And what I found interesting was I, was I was listening to someone talk, I think it was actually Snoop Dogg talk, um, about music royalties and talking about the, the way music royalties and percentages work. And I was he was going, yeah, they just say it's always the way. And I go, yeah, that's because they copied it from the book industry. That's where the music royalties all came from. They copied it because music royalties started out as sheet music. So that's the industry that started out producing sheet music, and then it developed the system up to and including recorded music. And so that's where they come from, and that's the royalties, percentages, and all these things, how they work. And so, yeah, that's the, when he's talking about that, that's, it's the same system. You get pennies on the, on the pounds. Yes, it's a sweater poodle. This is actually the live. Yes, this is actually the live today, uh, Andrew Cox. Because I was unwell on Thursday and Friday. Well, let's be honest. NATO was designed to keep... Um, NATO was structured and organised in order to do two, three things. One, keep America in Europe to help support the defense of Europe against the Soviet Union. Two, keep the Soviet Union back and stop them from invading by making it too high a risk for them to invade. And three, stop the German, uh, Germany having a reason to massively rearm, which, with the feelings of the rest of Europe at the time, would not have been good. Stop licking my mouse hand. That's not good. Good boy. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things. So, let's start off with talking about Brest. Brest is one of those places which is absolutely amazingly located, theoretically, on paper. If you are, you know, especially today, you can see the modern road network. Um, that's quite a, that's an okay road network. There's even a bit of a railway network in all these things do help supply modern breast. But, and please note this one, a lot of that didn't exist in the period we are talking about. During that period, 
Brest was chosen because of its wonderful location for attacking Britain. Yes. It was very good for attacking Britain. It was very, very good for attacking Britain. It was considered absolutely par excellence for attacking Britain. You see, the reason was because if we uh, start... No, this pause probably better. Start over this section, over here. You see there's a channel up there. And the channel sweeps. And so do the currents and the winds for quite a lot of the time of the year. So if you come out of breast, you can sail properly up the channel. So, Brest is brilliant for launching an attack on Britain. I have a feeling you're going to be wanting to go down in a second, so I'm going to do this before you start jumping. Ah! Oh! Sorry! That's like... Three times? In two days? Ow. Ow. Okay. So, as my fluffy research assistant was uh, saying, you're cute, yes, but you're also painful. Uh, this is a really good position. It's a nice deep water port. It's It's got supplies of water which can help you maintain the fleet all these things there and you can sweep out you can get into the atlantic it's a good position to get in the atlantic you can get up the channel you can go up also you can avoid britain and attack from the welsh sort of the sort of irish sea coast atlantic coast of cornwall um you can attack wales you can go to ireland It's, it's a really good location for a fleet to be based. However, no, we didn't, Runon. We didn't do that. Uh, I have dogs, not... Um, uh, basically, I, the, the rule is as long as they're well behaved, they don't, they don't have any unnecessary operations in our family. Mr. Weird, I didn't realize Guernsey and Jersey are that close to mainland. Yes, they're really close to um, France. They are really close to France. How is that? I've got corgi hair. Do you know, the, on random side on corgis, I, I cleaned out my computer the other day and it was full of corgi hair. Anyway. Now, Brest has. Well, you can see the network on this map now, because this is the latest Google Maps. And you can also see up above that I couldn't take out... I still couldn't figure out a way of doing a map and taking out all the restaurants I liked across the set of various, uh, various points. And I, I'm not sure if you can tell which area of Cornwall most of my family is located in on this map. But it might tell, uh, looking at where other restaurants I like in Cornwall uh, might well give you a clue as to where most of my family is based in Cornwall area. Um, but leaving that to one side, and... You're gonna behave. Breast is really, really good location for being very, very threatening for Britain. There's also the fact that if it's quite a difficult position to block. And the French looking for a position, a difficult position to lock. Now, when I was presenting the recorded video, I started off by reading a nice section of Nicholas Rogers' book. And guess what? I'm going to do the same again. Because it was very helpful, and because it rather sets the scene nicely for a lot of discussions. But this is one of the, um, let's see, 
Let's see, this book, Nicholas Rogers, Command of the Ocean. Um, Convoys by Roger Knight. And Far Distant Ships by Quinton Barry. All pretty darn useful books. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely, Raleigh. Checking, there was a message from your mother of uh, worrying if you had eaten, and at the same time, you let out the largest silent deadly. Oh, god, god, oh, Ay, caramba. Now, if you're looking, you see breast, and uh, if you see breast on the map and you see Normandy, there is a reason for things going on. Behave. Now, let's get to Nicholas Rogers. What we're about to do before someone distracted me with the worst smell I've smelled all day. Seriously. Sorry. I don't know. I love family, I really do. So, now. In 1758 and 1759, British fortunes had sharply improved in most parts of the world, except in home waters. The Western Squadron spent March 1758 under Anton's command once more, but scurvy and victualling problems limited him to six weeks at sea, though he once victualled a sea from transports on the, off the coast of Brittany. In October 1758, under Saunders, the squadron again failed to intercept French ships entering and leaving Brest. It was clear to British ministers that the Western Squadron had to do better. It was all the more clear as it became evident that the French government, with its naval strength and colonial position weakening fast, had decided to solve its troubles at a stroke by invading Britain. Once again, the English Jacobites were to play their part, and again there were unrealistic hopes of Spanish and Swedish and even Russian participation. By unorthodox financial manoeuvres, enough money was borrowed to keep the French Navy at sea for another summer. The plan was for the invasion force to sail the main fleet, which had to come from Brest and Rochefort. It was, however, impossible to assemble the army at Brest, which always depended on food and raw materials imported by coastal shipping from the rest of France, and which, by the spring of 1759, was already severely short of timber and unable to feed extra mouths. It was therefore decided to assemble the army around Vannes, in southern Brittany, where it could be fed and where the inland sea, inland sea of the Moravian provided an anchorage for transports. It followed that the Brest fleet had to sail down to collect the transports before returning to the English Channel. Now, this is the first point about Brest. It's a wonderful location, and I'll be getting into one of the reasons why it's a very good location for a navy to be based on um, in a second. But it is also a terrible location because it's got a limited infrastructure network to get stuff to it. And how do you get the infrastructure to it? Mostly by sea. So if you want to have a large army there, if you want to have a large number of people there, you've got to get the stuff to them by sea. You've got to get the stuff to them by sea. And if you're running a successful blockade, you can make that very difficult. Was it a worse smell than his early effort, Doc? Um, from Colin Cameron. Definitely on a par. UAD is fun. Someone is staring at me. It's dinner time. Yeah, that happens, Wayne. That does happen. 
Andrew Cox, I always wondered why the French didn't take Guernsey and Jersey and base and the men were themselves at Marlow or nearby. You have an actual defensive structure. Because those islands tend to have quite decent defences themselves. And you have never... Uh, to try and take Jersey and Guernsey, you would have to deal with some very, very independently minded people. It followed for the British fleet that uh, British uh, that Brest was now the key point. Intermittent cruises in the western approaches would not suffice. It was necessary for the western squadron to be continually off Brest or very near it. Never before had the Royal Navy faced the dangers of a close blockade of Brest. And their geographical situation needs to be explained, for wind, tide and navigation were as always the limiting factors in naval operations. Brest Dockyard now lies on a narrow river, the Penfeld, issuing onto a huge enclosed roadstead which itself communicates with the sea by a narrow channel, the Goulet, lying almost east and west with high ground on both sides. Outside the Goulet are two anchorages, Bethlehem Bay on the north and Camara Bay on the south side, themselves screened from the open Atlantic by extensive reefs and islands. Through which there are just three passages. To the westward, the Arois, is open to but scattered with dangerous pinnacle rocks to the northward the narrow and rock strewn fall with its formidable tide race leads into the english channel to the south the chasseur de seine a long re a ch chain of reefs and islands known to the english as the saints or the seams uh, stretches westwards into the atlantic through it there is one deep but very narrow channel the Reuse de sun with the Tenek Rock in the middle of the channel, at its northern end. The tide runs through the Goulet at three knots, the four at four and a half knots, and the Raz at seven knots. None of them could be passed except with the tide, and as it is 25 miles from the Goulet to the Raz, it required exact timing to pass both on the same ebb, or inward bound on the same flood. So that squadrons often had to anchor at least one tide, in Berthoum or Kawara Bay. The distances are such that there is no one position from which a fleet could watch all three channels out of the breast, except close in with the Goulet, where they meet. But neither is there any ground high enough for the watchers on the mainland of Brittany to see far enough out to sea to locate a blockading squadron in the offing. Corky hair. It gets everywhere. Sounds like my microphone just changed. It shouldn't have. Yeah, Razor Siren Elite microphone. It was better, and now it's gone down. I don't know why. Hmm. Perhaps it was I was on. Perhaps I was projecting my voice at the book rather than up at you. Uh, I'll make try and sort of keep the book at a different position. In the prevailing southwesterlies, it was easy for French ships to enter the Goulet, but to leave required an easterly or northerly wind, commonest in the late winter and spring between January and May. At other times of the year, the chance to sail from Brest usually came when one of the regular depressions blew in from the Atlantic over the British Isles, causing the wind in the channel to veer northerly and easterly. Overall, it is possible to sail from Brest on about 40% of the days in the year. Because they were often sailing in northerly winds, and because they often wished to avoid the British, the French tended to use the Raz de Seine more often than other channels. For a different reason, inward-bound squadrons often came the same way. It has been explained why Ushant was dangerous landfall. No sane navigator, unsure of his position after weeks at sea, would head straight for Brest. Lest of all a navigator plotting on the Neptune Francais, the official French chart atlas from 1693 until 1822, which lays down the port 35 miles out of position. Instead, French ships usually came in from the Atlantic on the parallel of Belle Isle, an excellent bold landfall from which a southwesterly wind would carry a ship on the port tack to Lorient and Brest, or rather starboard to Nantes, Rochefort and Bordeaux. 
Alternatively, they might first make Cape Finisterre or Cape Ortegal to fix their position and then strike northeastward, across the bay to Belle Isle. From Belle Isle, ships approach Brest from the southeast, past the headland of Pennac and through the Raz de Seine. For the British, this meant that at any close watch on Brest required a squadron between the seams and the penmarks, to use the English names. In which position the Brenton coast is a deadly lee shore, and the only possible escape in a westerly gale would be down into the Bay of Biscay, away from home. The only reasonably safe position for a British squadron watching Brest is west or northwest of Oshant, which uh, the, with, it, with the channel open to leeward. But from here, it is impossible to see the Raz de Seine. Mm-hmm. There were some of these were some of the difficulties facing Sir Edward Hawke uh, when he sailed with the Western Squadron in May 1759 under orders to keep as close to Brest as possible. There he developed a system by which the main squadron was kept in relative safety to seaward of Ushant, but in constant touch with an inshore squadron of two small ships of the line under a bold and skilful captain, Augustus Hervey, laying off the, rock, the black rocks at the inner end of the Erois, near enough to the Goulet to see anything coming in or out of Brest. Another small squadron was detached into the bay to watch Rochefort and the French transports in Morabian. Initially, Hawke was to return at intervals to Torbay for victuals and water, but by August he had 32 sail of the line, enough to take turns to visit ports and still keep 20 or so on station permanently. At the same time, a regular system of replenishment with fresh provisions at sea was developed, with transports carrying live cattle, vegetables and beer. This presented many practical difficulties, with deep laden merchantmen beating up from Plymouth to the blockading station, dead to windward, and coming alongside to transship their cargoes in exposed anchorages or even the open sea. Great determination uh, and expense were unnecessary, but as a result, Hawke was able to keep his ships continually healthy and on station throughout the summer and autumn. So, there you go. Next time someone asks you, when did the uh, idea of replenishment at sea begin? You can tell them. 1759 with a guy called Sir Edward Hawke. Or rather, with him and his flag staff working it out. The French map makers were... Well, the, uh, the, uh, the French atlas was... Interesting to say the least, um, Colin Cameron. Andrew Gotts can't help thinking the French weren't worried about having to intercept English attacks, but obviously wanted a safe haven from where they could sally when they wanted. Pretty much, they wanted to be able to attack the uh, the uh, English and the British, but they didn't think. No one had done replenishment at sea, and the only way you could significantly blockade Brest, and you could significantly block up Brest, was replenishment at sea. This is the point. To develop that capability, to develop a fleet that can keep on station in any weather, requires a huge amount of investment and a huge amount of time. Now, you have effectively doubled Britain's problem, because Britain's problem traditionally has been, let's be honest, the British problem, as I've explained before, and the whole reason for many, many things the British do, In diplomatic, uh, diplomatic terms, in military terms, in all sorts of scenarios. Is. Netherlands and Belgium. Because you can invade Britain from that end of the channel. Well guess what? The other place you can invade Britain from is the other end of the channel. And that end is controlled by France. Because they have Brest. And that's where they've stuck their naval base. So they can quickly get into that end of the channel and cause trouble. Now, admittedly, they have managed to stick it in a place where they have no military support. But the thing is, they can always, and this is what they plan to do several times, bring up a fleet from their Mediterranean fleet round. Their Mediterranean fleet would then secure the area... Sort of the uh, for the 
troop transports to get out. And then once the troop transports are sort of on their way, then the fleet from Brest comes out. The two fleets combine and they will fight off the British and will therefore be able to make it to Britain, land an army, invade, conquer Britain and you know what? All those people in Britain who secretly want to be Catholic or who secretly want to be under the rule of James um, and or the various young pretenders will be very happy and will come to their aid. The problem is that they actually tried that plan several times and it never worked. But we'll leave that to one side. So if a navigator has been at sea for a while, headed straight for breast, they were insane. Um, they were either insane or desperate. I'm noticing a pattern. Does the Royal Navy have a problem against naming ships after people who weren't royals or big in the age of sail? Mainly, it's a political problem rather than an actual Royal Navy problem. That's more the problem. The Royal Navy has a problem with... Um, they do have some major people they name ships for. But one of the interesting things is when you start telling people that actually HMS Queen Elizabeth is not named for HMS Queen Elizabeth II, it's named for HMS Queen Elizabeth I. It's named for the Virgin Queen, not the uh, not the Queen who was on the throne. Because we don't... Because of the convention which George VI started, we do not name ships after sitting monarchs. We name them after the previous monarchs. That's why there is a George, the six, a King George. I think it's George VI is in the Dreadnoughts, SSBNs. So it's a good location, but it's a problem. And they merely said about defending it. They did build Brest into an absolutely critical fortress. And it's a, you, you can see there, you can see the river, you can see the spaces. There is lots of space there to look after a naval base and look after a navy and put them together. It's very protected. It's very secure. It's... You know, it's an absolutely great place to do it. It's King George V. Ah. So he's still not like King George VI. Basically, we're not get the Royal Navy has so many old names to work through. They are adding in new names. As you are right, Kit and Knights are King George VI was supposed to be the leadership of what became the King George V class, class, class first battle ships. But that was because King George VI, VI insisted that King that it be named after King George V, which is what established the precedent that we don't name it after sitting monarchs. The new submarine is King George VI. I, so I was right. Okay. Sorry. There's, there's things going on. Anyway, I'd have to Wikipedia to check myself at the moment. I'm not going to because I can't remember off the top of my head. I know it's a King George. There were quite a lot of forts still there in World War Two. And quite a lot of fortifications were still around in World War Two. But Brest, uh, remember, Brest was still a critical naval base. It's still a critical naval base to this day. So... It's always getting defences and always getting investments in its defences. It's a really interesting place and it's a, it's a really historical place. Let me just do that.
the name was uh, the, the it was originally oh what you know there's a timeline of breasts available okay Originally called Bresta, we know in 1060s it had a moat dug around it. In 1240, it was ceded by the Count of Leon to the John I, Duke of Brittany. In 14th century, Tour de Tangi built, and that is the Tour de Tangi, is the medieval tower on a rocky mott um, beside the Penfield River in Brest. It's quite a beautiful, uh, beautiful tower. Um, there was the Battle of Brest in 1342, in which, when an English squadron uh, and fought, uh, an English squadron of converted merchant ships um, fought a mercenary galley force from Genoa during the Breton War of Succession. Um, then it was the Siege of Brest in 1386. Uh, Chateau de Brest, uh, the castle, is constructed in the 16th century. Then there's the Battle of Saint Matthew, Matthew, Matthew which um, took place in 1512. And that, of course, is between the English and the French. 22 warships of the French side, 25 warships on the English side. Three engaged on both sides, and uh, one warship destroyed for the French. It exploded and one damaged. Uh, one warship destroyed and two damaged on the English side, and yet the English are considered to have won somehow. Probably because the English lost 400, the French lost 1,230. Yeah, I'd say that's an English victory. Um... Then we have, in 1631, Riccolu, yes, that's Cardinal Riccolu, constructed a harbour with wooden wharves. In 1680, uh, between 1680 and 1688, Sebastian Le Preste de Vauban, yes, the Marquis de Vauban, fortified the harbour. In 1694, there was the Battle of Camaray, where an English squadron under John Berkeley, uh, of um, Third Baron of Strackley was defeated. And the St. Louis Church in 1702 was, con was consecrated. In 1749, the St. Ch Sevier Church was built. Then in 1751, the Brest Prison was built. Then the, in 1752, the Academie de Marine uh, was founded. In 1783, the Cristobal Fort is built. In 1784, Fort Montbury is built. In 1793, the Childers Incident occurs in the Goulet de Brest. <whistles> oh, these are the opening shots between British and French forces during the French Revolutionary Wars. Uh, in 1794, the French fleet under Villiers de Rejuice was beaten by Richard Howe, the first Earl of, Ju uh, Earl of Howe. There. And the prison of Pontio was built in 1805. Mm-hmm. Ooh. In 1898, they, the Brest Tramway is built. But don't worry, it took till 1865. They, they had a railway. And it was 1858 when they built the Nance, Nance Brest Canal. So all the things you needed to actually make it work... Are not built till the second half of the uh, 19th century. Andrew Cox. I read George VI didn't want a ship named after him as it would have been problematic at the revocation of the 8th. Uh, personally, I don't see that. That makes a present. Uh, no, actually, George VI was actually far more pragmatic about that. It wasn't about anything to do with his brother. He just didn't think it would be a good idea. Rather like the Deutschland is rapidly renamed after World War II begins. To Lutzau. Um, King George VI didn't think it sensible to have a ship wandering around. Which was named for the current monarch. In case something befell it. Uh, 
No, uh, Prince of Wales and Duke of York are traditional names for Royal Navy battleships. Dr. Clark, any clarification because warships have personalities. Were the galleys from genuine mercenaries or were they crewed by mercenaries? They were... Cr they, the galleys themselves... Uh, it basically, it's genuine mercenaries, but they brought their own galleys with them. Genoese mercenaries. Genoese mercenary galleries and uh, galleys. No, I know, some ship names. Rickover may have said fish don't vote, but fish also don't get touchy when you name a boat after a different species of fish. Yeah. <sighs> Andrew Cox, that's a far, far better explanation, thanks. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's one of those scenarios you have to sort of remember. And again, it was quite happy having a Prince of Wales, because technically, again, with HMS Prince of Wales, and this is, might be, this is one of the reasons why some people actually thought she was unlucky, right? You know, she was called Prince of Wales. But the trouble is, by that time, you have King George VI. So Britain didn't have a Prince of Wales. We had a Princess of Wales. So she shouldn't have been HMS Prince of Wales. She should have been HMS Princess of Wales, shouldn't she? But for similar reasons, King George the um, Sixth didn't want his daughter getting sunk. Which is either very sensible or is the reason why King Prince HMS Prince of Wales was so unlucky, because it was called Prince of Wales rather than Princess of Wales, which is what it should have been called. And... yeah. <laughs> oh. Sounds like someone's here to pick you up for your dinner, Fluff. Do you have a lead for him? Because he is wild and happy. If you want to, put, give me the lead. I'll put it on him. Oh, right. Sorry. Don't worry. He's off for his dinner. He's happy. No. Get back. You're not bouncing out there and knocking your sissy over. Hold it firmly, because he is jumpy. There's... Basically, the feral research assistant is out, and he's keen. Very keen. She was. I know there are some people. She was never known as the Princess of Wales because a it had been so associated with Edward, and this is getting off topic, but I will explain it as because it was associated with Edward. And there is also this idea, you know, that she couldn't be the Princess of Wales because King George uh, the the um, sixth could have a son at any time. But she was, she was the Princess of Wales. It's... The idea it was held back was uh, for that wasn't that. It was uh, technically she was the Princess of Wales, but you're not... The investiture and all the other things which Charles goes through are unusual. And it's not... It's, some, it's usually a political act when they decide to go for it. For example, Prince William is not going to go through all the investiture and all those things. Seeing your daughter reign tomorrow will be Princess Royal, not Prince of Wales. <sighs> Good Lord. Right, so. Yes and no. This is one of those things which I can get into the way. Um, the senior daughter is the Princess Royal, unless she's also the heir. Then she's technically the Princess of Wales. But she might not be called the Princess of Wales for two reasons. One, 
you could not as she could be technically titled it, but there's always the potential that it's not made public because if you're in this way, you're up to the king whether it's made public or not. That can be two reasons. The king could hold it, hold it back because he's still hoping to have a son. Because there, there you do have kings like that in history. Or because, as in this scenario, the Prince of Wales title was so associated with Edward, who had caused such a scandal that basically the monarchy was trying to make everything about him as disappearing as possible. Princess Royal is, again, another one of those titles which comes about and is, is, is around... And is useful, but usually it's a get. It's usually for a scenario where a king and his wife don't get along, and he needs his daughter to stand in for him. And it's been around in history, and stand in for the wife, and therefore it's become noted as the senior daughter gets called the princess royal. But that's also a. It, it's also a thing of technically any daughter can be called the princess royal. As I did just say, the Prince of Wales thing is how the level of it, of it being publicly, is a political thing. For both with Edward and with Charles, it was a very much political thing to make them the Prince of Wales. And you always have to remember that no two countries have the same monarch a monarchical system. So, Master Joshua, when were fortifications like the city perimeter in the picture stopped being built? Um, that's an interesting question because if you consider you you go to some of the fortifications which France was building on their perimeter, the French have been trying to fortify their nation for hundreds of years, and they keep up do, keep up kept on doing it. In fact, they they have only really stopped doing it since World War Two. I'm sure but only one Princess Royal knows how to handle a machine gun. Eh, there's a couple. So, this is the critical naval fortress because of its location, its, its, you know, its defences. It is the critical base. But that means the British respond. And the British response is the Western Squadron. And don't take this the wrong way, because this is going to sound terrible, but I have got the notes written out over there. And, um, yeah, my plan is to read my notes and scale them up to make them bigger so I can actually read them. I do realise it's probably... It, it's probably bigger on your screen than it is on mine. Because I have, like, four screens open. Or rather, I have my two screens divided in two. Now, the origins of the Western Squadron date back to roughly 1650. Hello, Verdun. Now, the Orange Western Squadron begin in 1650. Now, it's important because if we consider what who's in charge in 1650, it is, well, in 1650, there is... Various parliamentary governments have been in charge. It's not quite the Protectorate. The Protectorate starts in 1653. But in 1650, it's still very much Cromwell's government. Cromwell is very much the person still in charge. 
and they have a problem. They have a problem in France. They have a problem with the Carolinans, the people supporting the royal uh, the royalists. They have uh, problems with the Dutch. They have problems with pretty much everyone. Problems with the Spanish. But also, there is something else going on. And this is the trouble. You have to remember the reason that Charles had tried to use... That is, Charles I had tried to justify shit money with. Now, when Charles I was justifying shit money, he pointed to two threats. Two threats which he had to deal with. Those threats were the French! Traditional one. The one you hear about a lot of. But also the threat you don't hear as much about. Sorry. Hit my ear earlier with the dog. The dog hit my ear earlier and it's been weird ever since. Um, the other threat you don't hear a lot about is slavers. Yes. In up until not as long ago as you would imagine, it was quite common for Barbary vessels, uh, vessels from uh, the North African Barbary states, to make raids on Cornwall, on Devon, parts of Wales, some other parts of the southern England. And Irish coast, as well as France and Spain, in order to take people off to slavery. Now, I know about this. Sorry, I had a fly coming straight from my house. Go. I finally got it, I think. Um, I know about this a bit more than most people probably study it, because... For me, my family were involved in fighting it. My family were often hired to go and round and be defence formations by local lords. And the local lords would try their best, but, you know, they didn't have ships. And, of course, after you've had the civil wars between the parliament and between the king, well, you have a lot less of the feudal armies than you used to have, but you do have more troops than you not used to have around the country, and more trained soldiers. But they still need to deal with that problem. Because whilst the king had been laughably uh, overstating how much ship money he needed because of how, versus how much because uh, compared to how much he was actually spending on the navy, um, the, protect, uh, the, the government needed to deal with that. So, they get Captain William Penn. And they charge him with building a western squadron of six ships and of guarding the channel from Beachy Head to Land's End. Now, this proved effective. There was a village, there was one village which was effectively wiped out by Barbary pilots, pirates. Now, the interesting thing is, we are not sure who comes next after Penn. And I say this because after Penn, the squadron continues. And we have the fact that Parliament and the people in Parliament who seem to be in charge of these things are communicating with one captain. But he's neither the captain of the largest ship, nor the most senior captain in the squadron. And according to... It should be working according to seniority, if it's not working according to anything else. In which case, another captain is senior, and also commands the second largest ship. There is a captain who is senior again to him. And no, there's a captain who is the second most senior in rank, who commands the largest ship, and then it's the third most senior captain, 
who commands the third most largest ship, who seems to be in the correspondence with Parliament. So you tell us, uh, you tell me who's in charge. We don't know. We don't know. Now, in 1690, the squadron was put under Edward Russell, first Earl of Orford. That is Orford, not Oxford. And he's given command of a fleet in the Channel for the purpose of defending the nation. Now, this is kind of interesting because he is a very senior admiral. In fact, he's the most senior admiral who will ever command a Western squadron. There is a debate as to whether he's an admiral or admiral of the fleet at the time. And there's also a debate as to whether that makes him a four or a five star due to various differences in rank structure at the time. All fun. Actually, France only stopped building fortifications because it was pointless and a waste of time post-World War II, as they are more important things to worry about. Mm. Yes and no. So anyway, that is quite probable. You are on a 65-inch television. Woohoo! I've made it! I'm on a 65-inch TV. Um... I would argue cities are still fortified just in a different manner. Just look at all the sand mounting areas built in and around your London. Yeah, the only trouble is Britain doesn't have the SAMs to put in them. This is sort of point when some people point out the SAM mounting points around London, which exist around London, and I go, but we don't have the SAM batteries. So what are we going to put there? We don't have enough sand batteries to do anything, really. Um, wait for tomorrow with this with the home guard question, Rapper Isaac. Very cool, Verdon. Really? A debate on a 17th century admiral? What? Are there like three academics writing passive aggressive notes in fourth tier journals and blogs? No, actually, it's six academics in disturbingly high level history journals writing very, very long articles and reposts to each other. And has been going on for 20 odd years. Anyway, so from 1705 until the 1740s, the Western Squadron was pretty much one of the uh, one of a couple of cruising squadrons the RM maintained in war in that area. So there's a couple of there's, there's about two or three in that sort of part of the channel. There's another two in the other rest of the channel. Um, in its case, it was a cruising up and down the channel prepared to offer battle should an enemy appear before it, as well as covering any returning merchant convoys. So, you know, that's his job at this point. And in 1746, the Admiralty authorised Admiral Anson to combine all the channel commands into the Western Squadron, based in Plymouth. This was important as it was from uh, the be uh, from being one of the cruising squadron. It went from being one of the cruising squadrons to being the cruising squadron. They now had the resources. Anson and Hawk would refine the mission. Um, they keep trying to work in academic influence of mic drop and your mama into it. It's it's quite disturbing to read. Trust me. I was spent some time reading some of the articles about before putting this together and was going, oh my lord. These people really do not have... And then you realise that these people are getting promoted based on their academic output. So you have to remember, publication in journals is the key thing to look for for academics to get promoted up in ac and the academic structure. And so these people are getting promoted based on having an argument. That's it.
Now, during the Seven Years' War, therefore, the Western Squadron was one of the arguably Britain's most critical military assets. As its frequent patrolling of the entrance to the English Channel, regular sweeps into Bay of Biscay, and the waters of Oshant serve to keep others from threatening Britain itself mostly. But it's as the wars go on, especially once you get into French Revolutionary Wars, and it becomes more and more a blockading asset, that it becomes really, really critical. However, when combined with tra its other responsibilities of trade protection, particularly vis-a-vis -vis ensuring the safe return of inbound trade from the East Indies and the West Indies, other ideas for its operation were developed. After all, cruising was necessitated by the whole fleet having to go back to Plymouth and restock and repair and recrew at the same time. That gave opportunity for them to go out and added a predictability British, uh, British not being on station. So that is all what leads to the blockade. Basically, Melanie, Costa has pointed out, because I said, you know, we have this debate over who was in charge after Captain William Penn. We also had a debate going on as to what exactly his rank is, whether he's Admiral of the Fleet equates to a modern five star or four star because of the debate of different ranks. And both those are ongoing debates in the academic literature. And Carl said, yeah, really, a debate about on a 17th century Admiral? What? Are there like three academics writing passive notes in the fourth tier journals and blogs? And my response was, actually, no, it's about six to eight on each subject, writing in surprisingly prominent historical journals. <sighs> Roll on 10,000 subs. That might actually... Honestly, don't take just a thing. I've worked out and gone. Roll on about 20,000 subs, because, believe it or not, I spent... A lot of yesterday, when I was dealing the paycheck and stuff, working out the rough number of subscribers I would need to be able to tell a certain university that I didn't need to be worked for them anymore. And I worked out that if, based on my income increasing, at half the rate of the sort of... So if the number of subscribers goes up by 50%, my income would go up by 25% and sort of that sort of scenario, being very conservative. If I get 20,000 subscribers roughly, I can afford to tell a certain university to bog off. Trust me, that has made me getting to 20,000 subscribers very, very attractive to me. I'm not sure how to do it, but it's made me very, attra very attractive to me. Yeah, pretty much, Melanie. Uh, I do too much commercial history to that. I, because I do so much commercial history, I have to really show when I've done academic history that it is acad of academic quality and not merely commercial, a rebadged commercial pro product. To quote someone who was, who was a reviewer for a journal. Uh, so, interesting enough, here is a... Oh, I'm going to fix that. I forgot to fix it the other day, and I cannot believe I did. It's a noise. It's, it's annoying me. So. I presume the difference between commercial history and academic history is one people uh, one people listen to because they want to, the other people listen to because they're forced to, but we'll leave that to one side. Good academic history should be commercial in my mind because it should be written in such a way as to make it interesting for people to read. But uh, that didn't seem to dawn on this particular, conver uh, this particular conversant. Uh, they weren't reviewing my work, they were just having a conversation with me. as part of a group setting. I wonder why yeah, desktop chat is far behind mobile chat. Is it on live chat setting or is it on the other chat setting? Anyway. So, 
surprisingly enough, this kind of reads like a who's who of Royal Navy history. Uh, that's so surprising that the Western Squadron would read like a who's who of Royal Navy history. Look at 1805. When... Nelson is fighting Trafalgar, the Western Squadron is under command of Admiral Sir William Cornwallis. So basically, anyone gets past Nelson, if they manage to burn at Nelson, then they have to fight the Western Squadron. Mr. Raysback says I have an unhealthy attachment to you specifically. A, she vastly estimates and underestimates how much content you put out. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Throw it. Just because something is technical, uh, technical doesn't mean it has to be boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, leaving that to one side. Uh, so we have Sir William Cornwallis in 1805. The end Western Squadron would operate under the tradition of the Royal Navy ensign. Um, usually, the admirals chosen are fairly senior admirals. They are admirals of the white or the red. So, we have Vice Admiral Lord Anson, 1746, the seven. Then we have Rear Admiral Sir Peter Warren. Then we have Admiral Sir Edward Hawke, 1747 to eight and 1755 to six. He is supported by Admiral John Bing as well in 1755 to six. And then we have Lord Anson again. And the reason Hawk is supported by Bing is because when Hawk has to come home, and Bing is in charge, and when Bing's come, and then, you know, that's sort of thing. Right. Then we have Vice Admiral Lord Anson again. Still a Vice Admiral, ten years later. Slow rates of promotion going on at this time is terrible. I don't know. How exactly comes? You have an unhealthy uh, healthy attachment to that man. I sense a spreadsheet idea. Okay. Then we have Vice Admiral Sir Charles Saunders, uh, Saunders after Lord Anson is in charge of the to eight. And then we have Admiral Sir Edward Hawke back seventy fifty nine to sixty three. Four years. He's in charge, sitting off the coast of Bre uh, sitting off Brest. And then we have. Oh, I've realized. Uh, please note, I have realized that I'm gonna. It's. Please note, it's not all academics by a long way. It's just a small little margin of academics who get annoyed with these sort of things. And. Yeah, I don't understand people who get hung up over not, history non-academics don't want to read. I have a feeling I'm going to enrage some of those particular colleagues, because I seem to attr attract them quite a lot. Thank you, John Luke, for becoming a member. Um, I seem to attract them quite a lot because of something that's going to happen next week. It is going to happen next week. There is going to be some very interesting announcements next week. And I have a feeling that's going to make them even more annoyed with me. Um, then we have... Augustus Keppel, Charles Hardy, Francis Geary, George Danby, Earl Howe. Yeah, so we've got Anson and Howe. One of the things that I always find annoying is the fact that Hawke hasn't had more ships named after him. If you think about it, the last Hawke was going to be a Minotaur class cruiser, which was cancelled in 1945, and she was, there was also, uh, well, a sure establishment between 46 and 55, but yeah, Edward Hawke didn't get even a battleship in World War I time, and they've got Anson and Howe, and by my count... Hawk comes, is it reaches Admiral before Anson. So Hawk should have been there before Anson and Howe. And it's not as if there's Hawk there's an, a Hawk H W H A W K going around 
which is, you know, can be confused for. But yeah, we'll leave that to one side. Then we have Sir John Lindsay, Commodore, and Commodore John Levson Grower. By the way, that's because the Royal Navy Admiralty was quite so old at this point that, frankly, they had very few admirals who were actually capable to go to sea. So they started promoting Commodores, who were captains who were decent at the job. Um... You see, I think if they named the battle cruisers uh, and if they named the battle cruisers Hood and Hawk, I think they would both got a built built because no one's cancelling a Hawk. You know, the fact that they have cancelled the Hawk cruiser at the end of World War Two is because it's the end of World War Two. In wartime, no one's cancelling a Hawk, and at the end of World War One, no one's cancelling a Hawk at that time. Uh, then we have Admiral Earl Howe again, uh, 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 come back again in 1790. And then Admiral Sir John Bollies Warren, who is one of those admirals who you don't hear much about, was actually fairly decent. Admiral Edward Pellew, Admiral Lord Bridport. Bridport has a temporary command from 1795 to 1797, and then is made permanently in post in 1797 to 1800. So the poor guy spends the first two years of his going, this is supposed to be a temporary command, I'm filling in for someone, I could be sent anywhere else at a moment's notice. And next three years going, oh for goodness sake. Then we have Admiral Sir Lord, uh, Sir Lord St. Vincent, 1800 to 1803, who has for a short time his second in command, a, a very notable gentleman called Horatio Nelson. And then we have Admiral Sir William Cornwallis, as I said, between 1803 and 6, who is pretty much going to go, hello, if anyone gets past Nelson. And then we have Lord Garner. And then we have Admiral Lord St. Vincent back, 1806 to 1807. Which again shows that the naval threat wasn't considered over. Because if they're sending St. Vincent out to sea again between 1806 and 7, that's a, there's a problem out there. There's something worrying about it. Because let's be honest, your other option to do that is to draw, uh, call Collingwood back from the Mediterranean. No one wants to do that. So you're sending out St. Vincent. And then we've got Ghana, Gambia, Charles Cotton, Keefe. Um, in 1830 to 30, 31 to 2, we have Codrington. The fleet is definitely a wartime squad. It's definitely a wartime force. And then in 1833 to 45, it's uh, disbanded. And then it's finally, it's sort of raised again. In '46, on a Commodore Sir Francis Collier, that shows it's raised initially as a deterrent method, and then it goes Vice Admiral Sir William Parker, who of course I've talked about before. He's in Andrew Lambert's Admiral's books. Very, very good commander. Very, very good officer for his time. And then Rear Admiral Sir Charles Napier, again no slouch going on there. And Rear Admiral Amar Arma Larry Conry, Corrie, who is one of those officers who. Honestly, gets forget or forgotten. Now, he is. Oof. How do I how do I explain him? Um. He died in Paris in 1855. That tells you a lot about him. Uh, he entered the Royal Navy in, on the 1st of August 1805, became a lieutenant in the 28th of April 1812, a commander in the 30th of June 1815, and captain in July 1821. He commanded Barham off the coast of Spain between 1835 to 1839, between 44 and 40, 1844 and 45, he served in the Channel Squadron as Captain of HMS Superb. He was promoted to the Rear Admiral in March 1852, and what for was he was straight to put in the command of the Western Squadron. Um, in 1852, and then... 
he was then assigned to second in command of Vice Admiral Charles Napier, who was in charge of the British fleet in the Baltic. He fell ill during the Baltic campaign and was invalided home, but never fully recovered and died in Paris en route. Interesting officer. I like confusing the marketing department, it causes fun. Admiral class for Type 46. Oh, that'd be fun. Oh, well, it's the Type 83, isn't it, the next one? So, Admiral class for Type 83s. So, here is the big thing. We've turned the fact that, you know, this squadron gets a lot of senior officers, and good senior officers. Please note, there's another thing going on here. These officers are all quite politically connected. This is a squadron which is going to get support. It's going to be politically connected because they want someone they trust in charge of it. It's got to be someone who's going to do the job they need them to do. And the job they need them to do is to fight the French if they come out because of that location. Because, as said, this squadron's got to be there. But because they're politically connected, those officers have been able to go, um, we can't do this from Chatham. We can't do this even from Portsmouth. And they try. So in 1692, the French make made their primary fleet base Brest in the Atlantic. And six years later, after trying every other cheaper option, the Admiralty authorised the creation of the completely new dockyard to be built at Plymouth, housing a dry dock and a wet deck. By 1798, it looked like this. Please notice there is a big difference between this and this. This is a fairly decent port, which happens to be in a great strategic location, which is developed into a naval, uh, na developed into a naval base and fortified heavily. Plymouth is somewhere which is built as a naval base becomes a city around that base and is fortified to defend it as such. Um, those aren't just the same names. Those are the same people. Uh, the reason you see so many Admiral Sir Edward Hawks is because Sir Admiral Edward Hawk comes up quite a lot. And it's the same with Howe and the other, uh, sort of the others. But the fact is, those are, mm, you know, it's like Gardner serves twice, Vincent serves twice. They have other posts they go to, but they serve twice because they're useful. And you always have to remember, the sea is a bit of a, um, a democracy. In that the sea gets a vote in who gets promoted. Because if you are a stupid officer, you will get yourself killed at sea quite regularly. Quite easily. That's another reason why it wasn't like the first sons. It came prestigious, yes, but it wasn't ever liked for first sons. If you're a first son of a noble family, you were sent to the army. Less chance of you managing to kill yourself through stupidity or someone else's stupidity. If you went to see it Navy, yeah. I, was trying to, I mean, I recognize a lot of names from different services and eras. Yeah. But the British aristocracy has a habit of going to war. And as I've discussed in a previous video, people like Lord Germain are not really looked upon politely by others for, do for what they've done. 
if you've deserted your post, if you're felt to have disobeyed orders or have not behaved properly, I be ordered from the field at Minden because of your bad behaviour. They will make the point and they will get rid of you. It's the easiest way to lose your standing in British aristocracy. But please note also, a lot of these people become Lord because of their naval service. You know, that that's the thing with the British. The um the other way the, the aristocracy works two ways. One if you're very successful, if you are a successful aristocrat, they will shout and collar your name. If you're a successful non-aristocrat, they will make you an aristocrat, so you become a successful aristocrat, so they can shout and holler your name. And then we have Portsmouth and Plymouth. Plymouth is the interesting one, because let a Plymouth literally is built in response to Portsmouth. Uh, to uh, Brest, I mean. That is literally how it turns out. Because the Royal Navy has to deal with Brest. They have to be able to focus on it. And they have to be able to support themselves fighting it. And so they need it. Now, interesting point is there is some debate as to when on off this starts because some people put it down to Prince William Orange becoming William the Third and William and Mary wanting to have build the um, a dockyard west of Portsmouth. It's actually earlier because it's is authorized earlier than that but it is by the time it starts William and Orange William and Mary are in power because well William becomes King of England and Scotland and Ireland in uh, 1689 But it's... How do I put this? 1698 when they start the creation of it. 1689 when William gets involved, but the British have been looking at it for a, more, for a longer time than that. And the need of having a base in that area. And you've had surveys happen before Edward Drummer, Edmund Drummer, Surveyor, Surveyor Navy, is sent to the West Country to find a new site. And he does look at places. They've looked at them already. Falmouth, they've looked at... Well, Falmouth, they looked at a lot. Because Falmouth was considered pretty defensible. Um, and he looked at... Um, the Hamoas, which is, of course... Uh, an interesting area between, well, let's see, uh, between the River Lyda and Plymouth Sound, but he also looked at Plymouth proper, and I said he looked at Falmouth, he looked at a few other places as well. Where is it? Brain. I'm just going to put up, I'm just going to do the cheat and do Google Maps and have that come up. And then I'll remember the name of the place you're looking at. Google Maps. Oh, it begins with a T. Torquay. Torquay. There you go. Brain engaged. They looked at Torquay. They looked at Exmouth. They looked at Plymouth proper, and then they looked at sort of 
in the River Tamar Hamas area, which is where actually they end up siding on. They looked at Fawi and uh, or Foy, Fawi. And they, as I said, they looked at Falmouth and St. Moore's area. All those areas were looked at as potential options. And the difference is the British are trying to balance three things. One of which is actually infrastructure to be able to support and supply. Anyway, it takes them years. And then once the French establish... About three years late after Williams come to the throne, the French established their base in Brest. That adds extra urgency to it. Now... They start off... With Plymouth Dock in 1690. But eventually, by 1698, they're authorising the creation of a completely uh, new dockyard, which is why they're doing sort of hammers, housing a dry dock and a wet dock. And it takes years. And by 1798, it looks like this. It's just, it's a long, long process of construction and of work. Now, this is the painting chosen is the Nicholas Pocock one. And you can see um, the stone basin, well, the wet dock and the dry dock, which were built by um, Duma. in the centre. So this bit in the centre here, you can see, is the original Duma creation. John Luke, the Ron AV in the pier was not above hanging admirals from her. It will put the fear of Yes, the Ron AV hung an admiral, and um, they did nasty things to other admirals as well. Um, hanging wasn't necessarily the worst thing that could do it before you. Yes, you were dead, but it did, the, the Royal Navy had worse things they could do to an admiral. So, first point you've got here, you're having to develop infrastructure, because the Western Squadron can't exist without infrastructure to call on. You cannot support the Western Squadron from, you can't support it from Portsmouth, you can't support it from Chatham, it's too far away, it's not the right tides and currents. You're going to have too much issues if you're going to be blockading Brest, if you're going to be operating this region. And it's worthwhile considering that when we start talking about Brest being blockaded, we're talking in the time under Hawk. We are talking in the 1760s. Is when it's sort of well, 1759 is when it really sort of they really do the full blockade of France, and that's after this base has been under construction, been development for. Hmm, well, I said you can go back earlier, you can go back later, you can date it how you really like. 
Uh, there are issues, different various points, certain points you can start to take from the point at which it's being dated and developed into a full base. I put the dates I have in there. So I'm going to go with them. So 1698 to 1759, you've got roughly 61 years of developing a base. So that's 61 years of infrastructure development going into it. Trouble is, Brest doesn't have a similar level of long-term investment and development, really, because, well, one of the first things you need to do is you will need to come up with some sort of high position to allow you to watch out at sea. So, let's be honest, what should you do? Probably build a tower. A nice high tower. If you're Brest. Now, the Western Squadron managed to get into battles quite early on, and if we consider this is 1692, this is the same year that France has made their front of fleet the primary base in Brest, and it's a few years before Plymouth really starts getting going. No, um, the worse thing than death, well, death, it's a stain on your family, but your Various people can get out of it, and it's not a per, it's not a familial stain. It's not a wider stain, but they can, well, they could conceivably cashier you, or they could send you home, or they could send you to a posting where you would definitely die. There are postings around the world which are definitely not attractive. Oh, and there's also the other scenario, they can send you to the postings where you will never make any money. So you will have the, uh, you will have to either beg for money from people to support you as an admiral, because remember, an admiral has to maintain an admiral's table, etc., which is part of the reasons why prize money is split as it is, and all those things. Or, and this is the other point, you will have to resign your commission and return home in ignominy. The Royal Navy can be quite cruel when they want to. <sighs> Sorry. Still getting over this illness. Well, when I say illness, over the, the... The nights of fun. The nights of definitely not pleasure. Now, the battles of Barfle and La Hogue are interesting because, well, no lesser figure than Churchill calls them the Trafalgar of the 17th century, which I can tell you now is complete and utter twaddle. I do love Churchill. He is fun. But he is, um, how do I put this? Never short on selling a particular story when he wants to. Now, this battle has curious influence in both Mahan's influence and sea power of history, and, well, I would argue um, Strategic Theories by um, Castex, which was published in 1994. I argue both of them have quite a disturbing obsession with it. But... This is a battle with background, and with some, some deserved notoriety. Now, the French had won the battle at Beachy Head in June 1690, which had opened up the possibility of them being able to destroy the Anglo-French the Anglo-Dutch fleet, I mean, sorry. Anglo-Dutch fleet and landing an army. Louis XIV and his naval minister, Louis Pelletieu, planned to land an army in England and restore James II to the throne. Their plan was to launch the invasion April 1692. And by the way, the story of the Western Squadron, Plymouth and all these things... Is the story of in French planned invasions of Britain. Now, this was 
the plan was to do it in April 1692, which was supposed to be earlier than the English and Dutch fleets were expected to be able to put to sea and combine. Now, the invasion force was to be made up of the Irish Royal Army, which, of course, had gone into exile after, well, sort of, after the Siege of Limerick in 1691. The troops were collected at St. Vast La Hogue. Cavalry and guns were to be loaded into transports at La Havre. And the French commander was Anne... Hilarion de Tourville. Now, please note, I do not know why Anne was called Anne. I just, I, I, I presume in this period that it was a more, well, from my reading, it was, because I was sort of first reading, going, well, hang on, this is not the first time the French had deployed female commanders against the British, so there was a possibility when I first read it uh, many years ago. Hang on, there's an, there's an Anne, you know, I was mainly thinking, is this, another, is this the first female admiral? Why haven't we heard more about it? No, it is actually a bloke. Um, not sure why his parents called him Anne, but Anne was far more of a, could be male or female name at the time in France. And he was made Marshal of France in 1693. is an interesting gentleman and there are statues of him all over the place now The French were um, having fun, though, because whilst Anne Hillen de Tourville, the commander, was able to bring the French fleet up from Brest, collect the troops and transport some troops. Well, he was supposed to collect the British fleet up from Brest and, you know, collect trans transports, fight off the English fleet, land the army in England. They did, did. They gave him all this trouble. But they said, not only will you be in charge of the fleet, but the strategic decisions are to be taken by James II, Francois de Husson de Pontpress, and Bermenin Gilt de Belfort. Now, Bermenin was a experienced French soldier of Louis XIV. And, well, Francois de Husson is... interesting. Basically, the whole point was that J James II, Louis XIV did understand James II, but he was trying to surround him with fairly decent senior French officers. Unfortunately, though, the French fleet was unable to concentrate in time. Uh, Destres and Toulon fleet were beaten back at the Strait of Gibraltar, losing two ships in a storm. And Villette Merce and the Rochefort squadron were delayed. Tourvel's Brest fleet was undermanned because of where it was in the world, and trying to get actual personnel out to it was blooming difficult with all the infrastructure they had. Perfect location, perfect location for Britain, Britain. Terrible location to support. Build some roads. Build some canals. Build something, please. No. Well, we've got these ships here, we've got all this fleet here we've built, but we haven't got the food to supply the crews, and we haven't got the crews. Oh, good lord, who saw that one coming? Anyway. So, they were delayed by adverse winds and weren't able to clear the Baton Roads until the 2nd of May. So, Tourville entered the English Channel with 37 ships line, accompanied by 7 ships, plus frigates, scouts and transports. He's joined on the 15th of May by Valère and the Rochefort Squadron with seven ships in line and various ascendant vessels um, which gave him a combined fleet of 44 ships plus 10 vessels which was roughly 70 to 80 sail. The Allied fleet had assembled at Sul Helens 
Vice Admiral Red, Sir Ralph Delvell, arrived on the 8th of May, and the next day he was joined by Richard Carter, who had been in the Western Channel guarding a convoy. The Dutch fleet was sent under Philip van Almond from Texiel in April, and made its way south. Admiral de Blue, Sir John Ashby, sailed from the Nore on 27th of April. And Admiral de Fleet, Edward Russell, is delayed until the 29th of April, but gained time by making a risky passage through the Gull Channel. He met Almond at the Downs, and a further Dutch squadron at Dungeness, arriving at St. Helens St. Helen in the second week of May. Remember what the French decided? They had to get across by early April. All the, the Allies would have formed, to, uh, formed up. And now, it's the second week of May, they haven't gone, and the Allies have formed up. By the 14th of May, Russell had a force of over 80 ships in line, plus auxiliaries. And the French, of course, weren't forming a concentrated force. However, Louis XIV sent Tourneville strict orders to seek battle, strong or weak, for or fable, and thus he proceeded to do so, which is probably the most stupid thing he could have done. So theoretically we have a fleet action where you have the Anglo-Dutch fleet with 82 ships in line, three fire ships, roughly 39,000 men. Plus some attendant other vessels, some frigates, etc. Things. Versus a French fleet, which has 44 ships of the line, two frigates, a fire ship, and 21,000 men. Well, this is the thing. Uh, please note... Anne Hilarion de Costantin has is A double N E. So yeah. The fleets sight each other first light on the nineteenth of May off Cape Barfleur. There is a traditional history that this kind of feeds into the whole band of brothers idea uh, that Tourville then held a conference with his officers whose advice and his own opinion was against action. But he carried on with the king's own orders. And let's be honest, the odds are the officers would not advise such against the king's orders because they wouldn't be that stupid. Doing it would be very, very stupid. And this is the English Admiral of the Fleet, Edward Russell, 1st Earl of Orford. Mm hmm. Looks an interesting gentleman, doesn't he? Now, remember. Torville had also been advised by James, the second envoys, to expect English fleets to defect, English ships to defect, and line up with the French to fight the remaining English because they were loyal to King James. Okay. This is an honest question out here. If it was a Dutch fleet... That is a possibility. But we're talking about a French fleet. He, James is expecting, or at least his envoys are expecting, Protestant English captains and Protestant crews in this period where Protestant versus Catholic is not like it is today by a long amount of margin. To sail away from their Protestant, English, Dutch force, line up with the French, and beat up their brothers. And here is the art of the thing. If you think about it, if the fleets were broadly equal, maybe a couple might do that. Maybe a couple might do that. 
But if you're thinking of, sorry, of there are 82 ships of the line on one side and 44 on the other side. So if I'm just doing the broad speaking maths, if I, to, in order to equal equal numbers because of the differential, okay? There is 38 more vessels on one side, uh, one ship's line on one fleet side than the other. So I would have to bring with me at least 19 ships in order to equal the numbers. I'd have to get 19 ships to leave to just give me equal numbers. What are the odds there are 19 ships going to? No. Now. The fleets slowly close in the light of a southwesterly breeze. Brussels coming from the northeast. And Torville had the weather gauge from the south on a starboard tack in order to bring his line of battle into contact with Russell's. Now, the interesting thing is some people make the point of these. Both fleets are all uh, both fleets are divided into three squadrons. Well, the British fleet is not divided into three squad uh, the Anglo-Dutch fleet is not divided into three squadrons. It's divided into four. There's roughly three in the English fleet, and there's, of course, the Dutch fleet, which is also acting as its own squadron. Each squadron is fit into multiple divisions, and which are commanded by a flag officer. This is why you have the coloured system, because the originally was you formed up your fleet into one fleet. And all these ships together. And then you'd have a rear admiral, a vice admiral, and a full admiral. And each would be in command of their division of ships. So, broadly speaking, you can, for all in principle purposes, divide the 82 by roughly 4. Okay, 20 ships. And go, oh, so it's going to be roughly 6, 7 ships per division. So, again, thinking about that, for 19 ships to leave, that's basically saying you're going to take a whole squadron. A whole squadron. So you're taking the Admiral, the Vice Admiral, the Rear Admiral, all their ships. Now, owing to the calm conditions, it's not until 10 hundred hours, four hours after first signing each other, that the two fleets engaged. Torville, as long as he holds the weather gauge, was able to break off the engagement and after he damaged enough the enemy. That seems to be his plan. His plan seems to be do enough damage to the, Brit uh, to the Allied fleets that I can say I've damaged them and then get away. However, to do this, he had reinforced his center, the White Squadron, which was under his own command, in order to engage Russell's Red Squadron, which held close to equal numbers to him. Elsewhere, he sought to minimize damage by extending and refusing the van to avoid being turned and overwhelmed, and the rear was held back to keep the weather gauge. Russell counters this. Remember, Russell has very nearly a two-to-one advantage in ships. He can counter things. You've concentrated your fleet. Great, I can match those numbers, and I ain't put a den in anything. Russell countered by holding fire as long as possible, so waiting till he got as close as possible. 
in order to allow the French to come closer. Because the French, if the French aren't getting fired back at, they're going to come closer because, again, they can cause more damage the closer they get. He put the Dutch in the van. That's in the front. Almond is in command. Extended to try and overlap the French line. While Ashby, who was in charge of the rear and some way off, sought to close and bring his blue squadron into action. Now, from around 1100 hours, the fleets bombarded each other, causing considerable damage, and the battle continued for the rest of the day and well into the night. At 1300 hours, a change in wind allowed Rear Admiral the Red, Sir Clowsley Shovel, to break the French line. Yes, breaking the line. It's been done before then, it's done after then. It's, of course, most famously done at Trafalgar. But breaking the line is something which has been part of naval history for a long time. Crossing the team, breaking the line. It's an important part of it. A flat calm descends at 1600 hours, which left both fleets in a fog, which is really not good. The fog is made worse by cannon fire. The smoke really just adds to it. And at 1800 hours, Torville was able to use the tide to try and gain some respite, but Shovel used the same tide at 2000 hours for a fire ship attack. At 1000 hours, uh, at 2200 hours, the battle is almost over really. It's, you know, there's not much fighting going on throughout the night. Sure, most ships on both sides were damaged, some severely. No ships from either battle line had been lost, and there is some fighting going on in the morning as well. At the turn of the tide, Torville managed to cut his cables and tried to carry his fleet down the channel on the ebb, away from the scene of battle. Russell also cut when he realised what had happened in order to give chase in the night. And this is why, to this day, there are many battles like this. You can find anchors all over the place in the channel. Now, on the 30th... Oh, by the way, I think I said the 19th of May earlier. I mean, it meant the 29th of May. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have other notes which have the 19th of May above them. This caused me fun in the first video. Anyway. On the 30th of May... I'm going to have to fix my notes. Let me just rewrite my notes. Yeah, now the space between them. So if I do this again, I don't... This is the trouble. I haven't used the notes first for a long, so long, long time. The trouble is, when you're ill, you forget. You make it even worse. On the 30th of May, the French withdrawal was hampered by wind and tide. I'm afraid that due to the cost concerns... Yeah, cost concerns have come up again. The French... Uh, well, the Minister A. Marine... Under that wonderful gentleman who'd come up with this plan. Remember, you know, Louis de, uh, Louis the Fourteenth's arch planner, Louis Felfiu, um, who was 
critical, Chancellor de Pontchan, French politician, very skilled officer, a very skilled bureaucrat for Louis the Fourteenth, had um, made a decision to save money and due to the cost concerns. And so they bought the cheaper anchors, which turned out to be inadequate to withstand the strong tidal races in the channel. And so the nearest French, uh, this was made worse by the fact that the nearest French port, Cherbourg, was not fortified. Um, no, uh, basically what Seneca's pointing out is the British had the red, the blue, the white, and the animals of the yellow. And the animals of the yellow was basically a way of putting you into the reserve and retiring you. So if you're an admiral of the yellow, you've been promoted to it. Yay, you've been promoted to a member of the yellow fleet, but now you won't ever sow at sea. So yellow is a good way of getting people off into reserve. Now, on the 30th of May, the French fleet was scattered into groups across a wide area. To the north of the battle scene, and heading northward, were Gavaret and Langon, uh, with four ships between them. They skirted the English coast and headed out into the Atlantic. They went sort of... how do I put this politely? So, on this map you can see... They basically went from Balfour and La Hague, which again, if you look at this map, you can sort of see. Now, they went up and round along the English coast and out into the Atlantic and then round to Brest. Which is the nearest fortified harbour? Nesmond, managed to the south of them, were headed southeast towards Normandy coast with six ships. These would beach at St. Vast, La Hogue, uh, while another two were put into Le Havre, one of which Lantanou was wrecked at the harbour entrance. It was fun when that happens. So again, if you, you can see Le Havre here. Uh, if you look uh, next to Rouen and above Cannes, Le Havre, of course, is there. Lovely area of the Normandy coast, lovely area. And, um, so that's some ships lost already. Nesmond, with the remaining two ships, which were Monarch and Amiable, passed through the Straits of Dover, went north around the harbour entrance, uh, went, um, north around Britain, and finally arrives safe at Brest. So literally retreated the steps of the Armada. So it goes from here all the way up sort of, sort of um, uh, all the way around Britain, down coming in through the Atlantic and slowly into Brest. And then heading west, the main body was in three groups. We have Villette leading with 15, Danfrel with 12, and Tourville bringing up the rear with 7. The French slowly tried to close up as a formation during the day. And Tourville has hampered his efforts by his, by his also attempting to save his own flagship, the Solier Royal, which was... Basically trying its best to look like, um...
Probably to look like the Lutzel and, uh, and look out, look like the Sadlets. Look out like the Sadlets. Yeah, after um, after Jutland, it was trying its best. And later in the day, he actually trans uh, transfers to Litenbyshu. Why are we talking about caravans? Something has gone really weird in the chat. We're talking about driving speed limits and caravans in the chat. Now, Russell decided that he was going to focus on pursuing the major fleet, a bulk of the fleet. Also, he quite liked the look of the Solid Royal and thought he might be able to get hold of her. He was thinking that might be a nice prize to have. It would be a nice to retire on. So, 31st of May, the French fleet anchor across against the tide off Cape de la Hague. And the leading contingent, 21 ships, under the command of Pan Panatea, had rounded the Cape and were in the Alderney race. While the remainder, of 13, were with Tourville and the other flag officers were to the east. As the weather deteriorated... These 13 ships began to drag their anchors and were forced to cut and run before the wind and tide. Russell carried on pursuing Torville eastward along the um, Koshan coast. Torville, without anchors anymore, is unable to beat, do more than beach his ships. So three of the most badly damaged were forced to beach at Cherbourg. The rest, 10 ships, reached St. Vas La Hogue. Where they were two, or where they were also beached. Remember, he has no, he has no, has no anchors because the anchors keep breaking, and because they are terrible anchors because the French were saving money on anchors. Joining the two of Nesman's division that were already there, so. There are now 12 ships beached at St. Vars La Hogue. Now, Russell took the ships with him and some of Ashby's Blue Squadron to, pursue, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, pursue Torville, whilst Ashman, Ashby and Armand were watch were shadowing blockading Panatea, Panatea's group which was sitting in Alney race. Panatea tried to escape by going through the hazardous passage through the Alney race. Uh, he managed to find a good local sailor called Heveriel to act as pilot when his navigators navigators didn't want to. Almond and Ashby didn't follow him. They didn't have that. Uh, they were criticised by Russell for not doing so. But the trouble is, the only British flag officer who knew the waters, Carter, had died of his wounds already. And frankly, there was no British pilot in the region who would take him through the only races. Almond attempted to pursue the Panettiere and his squ uh, squadron by taking his squadron west of Olney, but the delay allowed Panettiere to pull too far ahead, and so Amon the Bad of the Chase, and Panettiere reached St. Marlow and safety. If we look down here on the again on this map, St. Marlow, you can see is directly below Jersey. So basically, the entire race is going along from pretty much La Havre all the way down to St. Marlow, so all around the Normandy coast area. And you can't see what I'm doing with my mouse, but I'm actually circling at the area now for you. Just to be, you know, because I can. But the mouse, of course, doesn't show up on the screen. Sad. Got to find a way to try and do that, but then I'd have to probably lock my mouse and I wouldn't have control of other things. That would be annoying. Now, 
Now, at this point, we have to um, rejoin the rest of the French League, which is not safely in St. Malo. Soleil Royal, Amelon Triumphant were all in such bait, a, b a bad shape. They'd beached at Cherbourg. Um, next day, they were destroyed by Vice Admiral de Laval attacking with longboats and fire ships. And then Russell turned on the remaining uh, turned on the remaining ships. Between the third and June and the fourth of June, um, various English and Dutch uh, attacks were carried out with longboats, and the French crews, who were pretty much by this time exhausted, distressed, and upset and disheartened and demoralized basically collapsed so the allied shore parties and fire ships managed to burn all 12 ships line which had sought shelter there now the french tend to treat it as Sever separate battles. The English history treats it as one big battle. Most neutral observers seem to treat it as a one big action because it all does come from one big action. Um, the French try to claim Barfleur is a victory, but La Hogue and Cherbourg is defeat, whereas the English claim outright victory. But it's not a Trafalgar. It is not. In the nicest way... Trafalgar is a great victory because it wipes out the opposing fleet. Yes, the French lose 15 ships a line, but... In the scheme of things, these, those days, that wasn't a lot of ships to lose. Those these aren't the leviathans you have of the 18th, let alone the early 19th centuries. Secondly, there is a curious fact that both lists of casualties and wounded are listed as roughly the same. The British have two ships line sunk. <coughs> the English, well, British and Dutch, have two ships line sunk. And three fire ships destroyed. And they lose roughly 5,000 killed or wounded, apparently, according to sources. And the French have 15 ships line destroyed, two frigates destroyed, a fire ship destroyed, and lose roughly 5,000 killed or wounded. So something is going on here. Um, yeah, 50, 60 guns is about right. Uh... The Solil Royal was, I think, the largest ship of any fleet there at that time. Which is one reason that's why they were quite so keen to try and save it. Um, it, the Solid Royal was a 104 gun ship of line. But they were far rarer in those times. You are talking most of the larger ships of line are nowhere, uh, most of the ships of line are nowhere near that size at this time. But yes, the Solid Royal is a 104 gun ship of line. She's armed with 30, uh, 104 guns made up of 36 pounders, 18 pounders, 12 pounders, 8 pounders, and 4 pounders. Displacing 1,630 tons. She took part in the Battle of Beachy Head and the Battle of Burfleur.
So what is a Trafalgar level victory? Well, that can be an interesting topic of a video. What is a Trafalgar level victory? Uh, Tsushima, that's a Trafalgar level victory. Um, Midway, possibly could be up there. I think probably should be. Camper down, I put up there as a Trafalgar level victory. Although it's not recognized as such, it is, in my eyes, it's just as important. It's interesting. Perhaps it's important in the nicest way I'd add in because of the morale issues that it does create. Then we have the second Battle of Fizzin' Estate. And by the way, we have this wonderful the Edward, uh, Edward Russell, first Earl of Orford. Who is a really interesting gentleman, by the way, just before you sort of write him off completely. Um, he'd been a junior officer at Battle Sol Bay during the Third Anglo Dutch War. He'd served as a captain in the Mediterranean Sea in operations against Barbary pirates. Um, he was one of the Immortal Seven, the group of English noblemen who issued the invitation to William, asking Prince William Orange to depose King James II. He served as Prince William's secretary during the planning of William's invasion of England and the subsequent Glorious Revolution. He was commander of the naval support for William in the water in Ireland. He became first Lord of the Admiralty and held the office twice again in the reigns of Queen Anne and King George I. He was also MP for Launceston, for Portsmouth, and then for Cambridgeshire. He is a very important figure in history, and he doesn't get much attention. He really doesn't. I don't think anyone's scaring off 10,000 people. I really don't. I, 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 I don't know. Perhaps I'm just not good enough. I, I don't know and don't really wonder about it too much. I'd really like the 20k subs because that would allow me to do the things I want to do. But I'm also not going to start changing the channel too much or too or sort of in random things. I don't mind adding in extra things. I don't mind doing a premiere every now and again because YouTube seems to like promoting them. I don't know if I've got the right sort of topic that I think is good for it. I don't mind doing uh, shorts, and I know I should do more of those because YouTube really likes to promote those. I don't mind doing those sorts of things, but I don't want to change the channel much. People, start, There is, seems to be re semi-regular comments from people that they don't like me engaging as much as the chat as they do and chatting away, but I like doing that. So I'm going to continue doing that. And they find that sort of because... Well, the chat does occasionally get a bit random and wanders off with things. And so I sort of go and... I view it always as when I'm responding to the chat, I collect the chat and bring, try and bring it back to topic. But, like I do in a, in a seminar. But um, some people don't like that. And I can understand why they don't like that, but I like doing that because I like that interaction. I do my thing, yes. And the thing is, I like the way Drac does his videos, and I like the way I do my videos. We do them the way we do, because that's the way that suits us. Now, the second battle of Cape Finisterre, this is a very different battle than you previously saw. Because, for starters, this is a British fleet of 14 ships of line intercepting a French convoy. This takes place in 1747 and involves the Western Squadron. Now, it 
This is actually the first year that Hawk is in command of the Western Squadron. 1747 is the first year he's in charge. And it takes place in the War of the Austrian Succession. So, in early 1747, a, fleet, a French fleet of six ships of the line, including some of the most powerful ships they had available, and five Indiamen, commanded by Squadron Commander Jacques-Pierre de la Jeanfond, escorting a convoy of 40 merchant vessels bound for the Caribbean and North Africa. They were intercepted in May by Vice Admiral George Anson. This is the first Battle of Cape Finisterre. The French lost all six, six ships of line captured, as well as... And that was also, again, the Western Squadron. Please note, but that wasn't quite the same battle as the second, uh, Cape, uh, second battle of Cape Finisterre. there. And the French lost all six ships of the line captured, as well as two frigates, two of the Indermen, and seven merchant vessels. Most of the French merchant vessels managed to escape. On the 20th of June, eight British ships under Commodore Thomas Fox intercepted a French convoy, a large French convoy inbound from the West Indies. The es escorting French warships fled this time, and so 48 of the 160 merchant vessels were captured. Now, as a result, the, at this point, recently promoted Edward Hawke is given command of a squadron of 14 ships of the line. And these sailed from Plymouth on 9th of August as a Western Squadron. Now, Hawk, the first thing he does is introduce a new system of signaling between ships. The purpose of this new system was to enable an admiral to handle his fleet more aggressively, as well as to instill in his captains the desire of, give, of his desire to get, get to grips with the enemy, priority, uh, uh, getting grips with the enemy, which was his priority over. Adherence to what was the Admiralty sailing instructions of the line. Interesting note, this is often something which comes up. New Admiral comes in, puts in new sailing orders, new communications to try and get over the rigid Admiralty sailing instructions, which are more about not losing ships, i.e. forming line of battle, than fighting. Due to his considered inexperience at the time, he was given very detailed orders. But he basically ignored those detailed orders in order to make sure the convoy didn't get past him. Uh, in fact, he claimed he did not become aware of the contents of his orders until the day after he had found the defeated French. He, he, he just said he'd misfiled the note. In true British style, he misfiled his instructions until after he defeated the French, so he could report back, Well, I've won a battle! At which point, everyone's going to go, Ah, uh, what instructions? Um, and that day was the day when he found the French, commanded by Vice Admiral Henry Francois de Hibiers. Well, they'd set off on the 6th of October. Now, this meant that Hawke had been at sea since the 9th of August. If you think about that between that and the 6th of October, that means his fleet's been at sea for roughly two months by the time the French are coming to sea. And the British have had two months of training... Hawk's instructions. <laughs> they
They sighted the two fleets sighted each other on the 14th. This is approximately 300 miles west of Finisterre, which is of course the westernmost department of France. The British squadron, as said, consisted of 14 ships at a line. They were mostly between 50 and 74 guns. In fact, they only had one rated for 60 uh, for more than seven, uh, 66 guns. Um, the British ships are Devonshire, 66 guns, Edinburgh, 70 guns, under Thomas Coates. The flagship is Devonshire, which is captained by John Moore and is what Hawke was in. Kent, 64, commanded by Thomas Fox. Yarmouth, 64, commanded by Charles Saunders. Monmouth, 64, commanded by Henry Harrison. Princess Louisa, 60, commanded by Charles Watson. Windsor, 60, commanded by Thomas Hanway. Lyon, 60, commanded by Arthur Scott. Tilbury, 60, commanded by Robert Howland. Nottingham, 60, commanded by Philip Samoraz, who, uh, sadly, dies in battle. Defiance, 60 guns under John Bendley. Uh, Eagle, 60 guns under George, the then captain, George Bridges Rodney. That Rodney, yes. So, one of the captain, one of Hawke's captains is Captain Rodney. Gloucester, 50 guns, Philip Durrell. And uh, Portland, 50 guns, Charles Stevens. He also had a fourth rate, Hector, under Thomas Stanhope. Some fire ships, Dolphin, with 14 guns, under the brilliantly named Edward Cricket. The Vulcan, not sure how many guns, under William Pettigrew. No, I'm not sure if any relation of Peter, who turns up in Harry Potter. And uh, the Weasel, which was a sloop with 16 guns. Now, the French order of battle, in con contrast, they have the Tonan, 80, uh, 80 guns, under the flagship uh, of Duchaffel, and the Intrepide, 74 guns, under Comte de Vendre. The Terrible, 74 guns, the Monarch, 74 guns, the Neptune, 70 guns, the Trident, 64 guns, the Fougueur, 64 guns, the Seven, 56 guns, uh, they have Indiaman, the Content, which has 64 guns. And the Castor, which is a frigate with 26 guns. And a convoy of 250 merchant ships. Now, the British always have two options once they start, once they start the blockading system. They don't yet have the blockading in place, but the British, traditional British plan is this. Whatever you do, take out the warships, because... The other British fleets around the world will be able to take out the merchant vessels. You want to try and take out the merchant vessels because that will get you money. But the warships will also get you money and glory. So you want to try and take out the warships. And it's always better to take out the merchant ships where they're on the way home rather than the one that are on the way out because then they're loaded with the spices you want to sell, you want to buy and sell in in the UK. Whereas when they're on the way out, they're loaded with stuff which, frankly, the French want to buy and uh, want to uh, want to sell to the world, and you don't want to buy French stuff. It's French. It's terrible. Now, the French convoy on this occasion consisted of roughly two hundred fifty Mitch merchant ships, and as mentioned, they were escorted by eight ships of the line, an Indiaman. And a frigate. Hawke first seems to presume he's up against a much larger fleet of warships, and so formed the traditional line of battle. Not disengaging, he's forming the line of battle. Herbiers, the French commander, thought that the British ships were members of his own convoy.
the huge Union Jacks, the fact that they're sailing in line and they're heading towards you in an aggressive manner, did not in any way at all seem to disturb him from thinking that they were part of his own convoy. I suppose he thought, what are the odds of the British fleet actually finding me out here? Now, when he realised his mistake, he came up with a cunning plan. He'd use his warships to divert the British and allow the merchant vessels to disperse, which he hoped would allow most of them to avoid capture. Hawk, at this point, gives up his new signal, and he has a new signal. It's called the General Chase, which orders each of his ships to head towards the enemy, not at maximum speed, at best speed. Please note there is a difference in the phraseology. The French formed their own line of battle, but they kept the Indiaman, which has, of course, 64 guns, and the frigate, Castor, and the smaller French warships with the merchant vessels to act as their escort. When he got within range of about four miles of the French line, Hawk slowed the advance. He started to allow his slower-moving vessels to catch up, mainly because he noticed that the French were moving slowly, and they were kind of big. And they look sexy ships. They look the kind of ships which you want to take home to your Admiralty Court of Prizes. Yeah. You don't take them home to Mama. You take them home to your bank. And that's what they were looking like. Now... This point, he has to make a decision. Because... He can chase the warships, which will allow the French merchant vessels to escape. Or they can pursue the warships and risk Herbier coming at them from the behind. So they can pursue warships and then merchant vessels escape. Or pursue merchant ships and have warships potentially attack them in the back. So let's be honest, what, command, what option does Hawk actually have? Go after warships. What's the difference between max speed and best speed? Okay. Max speed is going to cause your fleet to spread out far more. Best speed means that you're going to have your group, your fleet form up to probably two or three groups. Because they're going to work out what is the best speed for us to work together. So best speed is more of a, in certain max speed is turns it into an individual race. Best speed forms it into a sort of mini group of races. Contrast the British British Channel. Big series of British Brits like quite like to like the French, but like to gently rib them, like them ribbing our food. Yes, we rib the French constantly. That's that's part of being British, and the French. Call us le rose beef and rib us constantly. It's it's normal. It's how we we communicate. I my, my, most of my family has family who are in France. Um, because again, we seem to my best friend. One of my best friends is has just had uh, well his. Lovely partner, because they I don't they haven't yet managed to get married. Um because of COVID, etc. Has just given birth to a lovely baby. We like I I love the French people, but I do like to rouse them with their history. But there again, they beat us quite well they beat us quite often as well, and I rouse the British for when he beat that beat that as well. Yes, it is it's a it's a sibling relationship. It's like any nations which are next door to each other, they tend to enjoy rousing each other. Now as you can guess, probably at this point, what are the British going to do? They're going to go for the warships, because there's no point going for the merchant ships and risk being attacked when you can take out the warships. And someone will get the merchant ships. 
So, at 1100 hours, Hawk again gives the order General Chase, but, focus, but also hoists the order to focus on the warships. So it's a General Chase of the warships. We're not forming up line, we're doing a General Chase towards the warships. And he angles towards the French rear. And it's a, they're able to form, a, they're able to get in a position where there are three British ships on the far side of the French line. And the remaining 11 ships, most of them, are on the near side. So they're doubling up. And this means the British sort of attack the three ships at the rear first. And then the next three ships. And are sort of going for it like that. The three rearmost ships of the French line, of course, because they've formed up strongest to weakest. So their weakest ships are at the rear. By 1330 hours, two of these three ships had surrendered. And so the British moved up the line. And they commenced each attack on each individual ship by firing canister shot into the rigging of the French sails. Now, the purpose is not just to try and immobilize them. You fire canister shot because you're trying to kill the sailors up in the masts. Who are the ones who are going to be furling, unfurling the masts and doing all the work. You're trying to kill the sailors up there. So you're trying to damage the masts. You're trying to damage the rigging. But you're also trying to kill the topmen and the, the, the people up in the masts who are actually key to it moving. Now... The British did uh, carried on with this, and very quickly the French found that the British sailors, the English sailors, who'd been at sea for as nearly two months under Hawk, were um, by this point better trained and disciplined than their French counterparts who had just been at sea just recently. And this meant they were attaining a greater rate of fire and were out shooting them. So again, the French advantage in numbers of guns was not paying dividends because of their training and their lack of, you know, in terms of that, experienced personnel. By 1530 hours, another pair of French ships had sunk, had struck their colours. So now four ships of the French remaining. Of the remaining four French ships... Three were engaged in running battles where they were heavily outnumbered by British ships. And each one was suffering from damage in their rigging. The French flagship, the Tonan, was holding off her opponents, but was surrounded and was being worn down. The Intrepide had not yet been engaged. She'd been the leading ship of the line. And she turned back into the fight. With her assistance, the Tonan is able to break free, and they escape to the east, pursued by the British, but managing to escape. However, the final pair of French ships, attacked on all sides, decide to surrender. Now, Hawke was very happy because most of the ships had behaved as he wished, and had closed to pistol shot range. That was how he described it which of course is very, very close range for the time. However, Hawke did, wasn't unanimous in his praise, and he felt that Kent had not been as well behaved, and so her captain was court-martialed and dismissed from the Navy. Thomas Fox was literally dismissed from the Royal Navy because despite engaging and fighting, he hadn't engaged aggressively enough. Now, Tim, is that, is that the same logic as a sentry for destroying the gunnery shot spotting tower, top tower and British cavalry ships to knock out the gunnery? Pretty much.
The British lost 170 men killed, 577 wounded in act and battle. Hawke was amongst those wounded. He was caught in a gunpowder explosion. Not enemy action, gunpowder explosion. The French lost roughly 800 killed and wounded, and 4,000 men were taken prisoner. Whilst all the British ships were damaged, all the captured French ships were badly damaged, four had had their marshaled away. They had to therefore lay to for a couple of days in the middle of the ocean to carry out repairs. The convoy, of course, was protected from this particular squadron of British ships. And only seven of the 250 merchant vessels were actually captured by this squadron. The balance of the convoy, therefore, the roughly 243 vessels, persuaded to continue to the West Indies. Uh, but Hawke sent Weasel, that lovely little sloop, to the Lee British Leeward Island Squadron, which was under the command of that lovely, notable Royal Navy officers, officer, George Pocock. Commodore George Pocock. And so he was waiting to intercept many of the merchant ships in late 1777, in early 1748, uh, trapped some in Caribbean ports. He had a lot of fun. So, yes, this caused uh, various personnel to make a lot of very interesting responses. One of them, and it should be noted, one of the people who's very, very happy at this point is Admiral Sir Peter, uh, Vice, uh, well, Vice Admiral Sir Peter Warren, who was also one of Anson's officers. And if you remember, the was at one point, was actually in command of the Western Squadron as well. He exalted to the British government, we have more French ships in our ports than the rain in the ports of France. The battle convinced the French government that there was no point fighting at sea and it decided to make no further efforts to fight convoys through the British blockade. This had the interesting effect of causing most of France's colonies close to starvation and especially the West Indies where they weren't self-sufficient in food which forced France to agree to peace despite negoti peace negotiations despite their victories in Europe, especially in the Low Countries. In 1748, the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle is agreed. France recovered the colonial possessions that had been captured by British in return for withdrawing from their territorial gains in the Austrian Netherlands which is pretty much the modern territory of Belgium and Luxembourg. And it is because of these victories that Louis XV is so reluctant to send troops and supplies to French Canada, Canada and his other colonies, believing them automatically to be lost the moment they're beyond his harbour. Conan Doctor, the way this battle, battle plays out, the French being about to over one turn, sounds like your alternate Jilton tomorrow. It's kind of a standard format for how naval battles can go. If you have superior numbers and you have the ability, you you have the ability to do it. You can do this, and that's re it's really there's a reason. It's the it's the absolute nightmare of pretty much any fleet. Hawk. Well, he was First Lord of Admiralty in 1766 to 1771, serving three Prime Ministers, Lord Chatham, Lord Duke of Grafton, Lord North. Uh, he'd born in the 21st of February 1795, so over 100 years before the Battle of Trafalgar, and died in 17th of October 1781, age 76, in Sunbury on Thames, England. Served 1720 to 1781.
He's a good officer. When he dies, there is Vice Admiral George Darnby in charge of the Western Squadron. Which brings us to the planned invasion of 1759 and the, broadly speaking, many, many wet dreams into, of um, Entienne Francois Duc de Crossol. I was asking, this guy gets a cruiser, not a cavalry ship. Wait until you hear what he does next. Because the, uh, the second battle of Cape Finisterre is not Hawks. How do I put this politely? Um, Hawks battles list include the Battle of Toulon, uh, the Battle of. Uh, fought in the War of Austrian Succession, the Seven Years' War, and various other scenarios. Um, but no, his his greatest battle is not the Battle of Cape Finisterre. Um, takes place uh, at the Sea of Fall of Minorca. Uh, he's the one sent to replace John Bing as commander in Mediterranean. Um, blockades Rochefort. Commands, of course, the blockade of Brest. Captures Belle Isle. Against his advice, because he says it's not, it's worthless. Uh, doesn't really understand why Pitt's so obsessed with Belle Isle. Um, but no, his greatest battle is coming. And his greatest battle is 1759. Now, the Duke de Churchill is an interesting gentleman. Uh, I would... He is a, a very interesting gentleman. Now... His father was one of the uh, was one of the leading advance uh, advisors to the Duke of Lorraine, who ruled the independent French speaking uh, French speaking um, Lorraine. At birth, he was titled the Comte de Saint-Ville. In 1737, the Duke de Lor then Duke de Lorraine, Francis Stephen of Lorraine. Uh, was pressured in giving up Lorraine and becoming ruler of Tuscany in Italy. So that France, as, and said so that France could get Lorraine. Um, Francois transferred his allegiance to France. He gained some experience in the Austro-Turkish War, uh, then entered the French army, and during the War of Austrian Succession served in Bohemia. In Italy and in Italy, where he distinguished himself at the Battle of Kearney. He's also pre uh, present at the Battle of Tetrin, uh, Dettingen in Germany, and carried news of the French to free, uh, defeat there to Paris. From 1745 to 1748, he serves in the army in the Low Countries, present at the sieges of Mons, Chaloy, and Maastricht. Uh, he attained the rank of Lieutenant General, and in 1715 married Louise Horin Croissant, daughter of Louis Francois Croissant, Marquis du Chateau, who died in 1715. She bought her husband a share of a large fortune, as well as um, her brother Pierre's Grand Hotel du Croissant on the Rue de Chiliclou, and was a pretty devoted wife. Chazol gained the favour of Madame de Pompadour, By procuring for her letters, King Louis the Fifteenth had written to his cousin's wife. And after a short time as Balliol at Vosages, he was given the ambassador of Rome. And then, well, he slowly gets promoted up and up and up. And then in... 17, 17, let's see, his first post, posting. Uh, 1758, he's made First Minister of State and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. He serves as First Minister of State from 1758 to 1770. He serves as First Secretary of State from 1758 to 1761 and 1766 to 1770 as for, as for Foreign Affairs. And Secretary of State of War, he serves as 1761 
to 1770, all under Louis XV. He is pretty much Louis XV's right-hand man. And he has ideas. He has dreams. He has a dream. His dream is to invade England. To invade Britain. Because that is how France will rule the world again. To invade Britain. And he's coming. The Duke de Choiseul is coming. So his plan was, and this is a, this is a, this is his plan. Okay. He had was upset by the fact that the British had managed to capture Louisbourg, the very critical point. in the previous war, and had managed to launch amphibious raids on France during 1758, uh, including places like attacking Cherbourg and providing fiscal subsidies to Prussia. Basically, Prussia was being kept afloat by British money from 1756 onwards. So, Chassol decides he's going to overturn this situation, and he's going to do it quickly. He's going to do a French invasion of Britain. But, he knows the British strength is its naval power. So, if a large French force manages to cross the channel without being intercepted, it could triumph over the relatively weak British land forces. Mm hmm He decided, initially, that this would be done with no French warships involved. No warships. Because he believed that trying to bring warships out of the blockaded ports of Brest and other places would cause unnecessary dis delays and could be disastrous. A mixed force would suffer the same fate as the Spanish Armada. And the previous attempt in 1774, 1744, which had been abandoned. His concept is this. A massive fleet of flat bomb transport craft would carry an army of 100,000 troops across the channel. The essential component, speed. The French would wait for a favourable wind and cross the channel quickly. Once they landed, they believed they would overpower the British army and end the war. And this has made the cornerstone of French strategy for 1759, along with an attempt to capture Hanover. And don't worry. He has an idea for where he's going to get the army. It's, it's going to be a curved one. He decides to bring involved the Jacobites. And the idea is that if they send the heir apparent on the movement, Charles Edward Stuart, uh, ahead of the invading, with or ahead of the invading forces, these would cause people to rise up. Unfortunately for him, Charles Stuart was supposed to meet in Paris in February 79th, but Charles turned up late and drunk, was surly and uncooperative. As a result, Churchill drops them from the plan. He did consider turning Charles to Ireland, where he could be declared King of Ireland and leader of Berlin, but um, that was problematic. And then they decided to try and recruit Jacobite supporters without actually, out, actually involving Charles directly. Uh, as because of his drunkenness and general stupidity, he was considered a bit of a potential liability. They also tried to get Denmark and Russia to provide troops and naval stores for the expedition. Both declined to participate. Sweden initially agreed to take part in the scheme by sending an invasion force to Scotland, but um, backed out of this arrangement when someone very discreetly pointed out to them that they would have to go over some pretty rough seas with a naval component being present. And the Dutch... Republic technically neutral at the time, were so alarmed by the French actions, they demanded assurances the French were not planning to place the pretender Stuart on the British throne, as they felt this would threaten their own security. 
And the French assured them, assured them they were not. Now, here's the thing. If you've had to do all this, and you're depending upon speed and surprise to avoid the Royal Navy actually being there, do you think the British might have heard you're coming? Can we just do a quick ask? If I, actually, can I do a poll? Do we think the British have heard the French were coming? Yes. Poll is live. Please vote. Do you think the French, uh, the British have heard the French are coming? While you're voting, I am going to get a drink because I've been surviving off liquids all day. So I am treating myself to slightly more iron brew this evening because... I need the calories. There are like... There are only 140 calories in this can. So far, let's see. Some people... Some people have actually voted no. Right then. <laughs> I am now going to end the poll. Let's see what the results are. 15 votes. 93% yes. 6% no. I'm not sure who the 6% were, but I love your sense of humour. Yes, of course the British heard the French were coming. In fact, the British were so aware the French were coming, they started... Well, it's no surprise that 1759 is when they develop and start spending uh, start spending money on maintaining a constant blockade of Brest at sea. Because very quickly, someone managed to explain to the Duke de Chosel that actually you do need warships. Because the British will have warships there. I'm not sure why they needed their secret agent just to tell them. The fact that they were meeting, the, the, the French were communicating with so many different governments. Uh, I think the news probably told them. Um, the On the 19th of February, the British cabinet meet at Lord Anson's house to discuss the potential invasion. Pitt and the Prime Minister at the time, Duke of Newcastle, were, as expected... Very confident. They decided to station troops on the Isle of Wight. But they also decided the existing strategy was sufficient to deal with the invasion threat. No plans were made to withdraw British troops in Germany or to request that Hanoverian troops be sent to defend Britain. Pitt was committed to sending expeditions to the French colonies. And he continued to do so. But something the British do do is they do put through the Militia Act, which creates a large militia to defend Britain. This, of course, force was untested, but it does mean that the British have roughly 10,000 regular troops immediately available to resist any French landing, and probably another 20,000 militia they can immediately call upon. And the thing is, if you have a uh, militia, they were being trained. They did have veterans of other battles in them. So they weren't exactly useless. They weren't as probably as capable as properly drilled regular soldiers. But they were going to add numbers. And remember, again, it's about that scenario which I was talking about when we we're talking about um, the Battle of uh, the, the Battle of Yemen. Or a Battle of Yemen on the 19th of March when we're talking about that. It's the same scenario. It's a case of balancing the cost of all these troops. However, 
And what they do do is they build up a very tight blockade. They have Admiral Edward Hawke sitting, op uh, sitting in charge of the blockade. They manage to improve the supply arrangements. And this is what you have going on. They are doing constant replenishment at sea, so the fleet isn't having to come home. They have ship. Uh, they have roughly a fleet of thirty odd ships assigned to it, and it's an. This is from the James Lind. It's an observation I think worthy of record that fourteen thousand persons pent up in ships should continue for six or seven months to enjoy a better state of health upon the watery element than it can well be imagined. So great a number of people would enjoy, or the most healthful on the most healthful spot of ground in the world. The British kept the ships clean. The British kept the ships, you know, so the disease wouldn't get into them. They kept the ships fed with better food supplies than probably most people getting at home. Uh, they were well exercised, they were well drilled, they were running out the guns and firing the guns every single day, so they really knew how to fire their guns, and they were exercise and they were manoeuvring as a fleet. Now, this whole scenario starts the feature up with the British doing raids on Le Havre to attack some of the French preparations. The French spend 30 million livres. By midsummer, they had 325,000 tran uh, no, 325 transports nearing completion, and they had 48,000 troops to take part in the invasion. So here's the other thing, this is the number scenario. Once you start, the plan was 100,000, and then it's 48,000. There's a big difference in that. And suddenly, you've got the scenario of, right then, so you're going across in high winds in flat bomb ships, so how many of those people are you going to lose on the way? And then you're going to find yourself fighting 10,000 regulars who haven't just man who are going to be attacking you immediately you come ashore, or as soon as they can do, and with 20,000 militia... Uh, this is starting to sound less good. Oh, and there's also going to be a fleet at sea. And which pit is being asked? Of course, which pit? This is William Pitt, the first Earl of Chatham. Tend to be called as William Pitt, the Elder. Now... What it really ends up resulting in, through various scenarios, is Hawk's greatest battle. The Battle of Quiberon Bay. Now, By the summer of 1759, the French had 73 ships of the line. 30 were abroad, 43 were in home waters. The ships in home waters required roughly 25,000 men. They were 9,000 short. Now, their reasons they're short is because most of their mariners are have either been captured by the British were engaged in privateering careers, were lost due to bad discipline as they were paid late, and some of them were also assigned to the transports being built, because all these transports require at least a cadre of skilled crew to get them across the water. The 43 French ships in home waters are split between Brest, which has 22 ships, and Toulon, mainly, with some more, uh, with a um, small number of ships at uh, in Lorient and Rochefort. The British had 40 ships of line in home waters and 15 in the Mediterranean fleet, which is of course based at Medi based at Gibraltar at this point.
Now, as I've mentioned several points now, Brest is at the position of a long and relatively infertile peninsula, which means its supplies of food had to come to sea, by sea, and um, there is a British blockade going on. So a typhoid epidemic had actually broken out in Brest between 1758 and 1757-58, uh, and uh, killed at least 4,000 sailors, plus all sorts of other personnel and all sorts of other people in that. Uh, the fact is, the French fleet in port was a lot less clean than the British fleet out at sea. It never, Knights of Grey never fell out of, uh, it never fell out of favour. It just wasn't needed. At what point between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and World War One? Or even, well, or really till World War II, if you consider the operations, does Britain need to do mass replenishment at sea? At what point in any of those scenarios does Britain need to do mass replenishment at sea? Think about it. In, it it's, it's like everything. It's a skill set which is developed, but it's only going to be maintained as long as it's needed, necessary. At what battles are you fighting you need to maintain it for? Because Brest was so terrible, the army has been assembled at Vannes, and its transport gathered in the Gulf of Moribund. Chosen because the terrain was more fertile, the anchorage was large and sheltered, and the men and supplies could be dispatched from Bordeaux, Rochefort, Nantes, and Orléans. In August 1759, the Mediterranean fleet under Jean-Francis de la Clue-Saban uh, managed to, uh, attempted to break out past Gibraltar into the Atlantic. Edward Boskin, the commander of the, uh, the Mediterranean fleet, caught them, and in the two-day Battle of Lagos, managed to capture three French ships, destroy two more, and blockade five more in the neutral port of Cadiz. Only two escaped to reach Rochefort. Bosquin left for the ships in Cadiz to be blockaded by Broderick and actually, this is the important thing, brings his ships up to support Admiral Hawke's fleet off Brest. He, he doesn't wait to be told to do that. He does that immediately. It's, it's one of the, the really good things about Bosquin. He is a very, very capable officer and understands immediately what he needs to do. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means Hawk has more ships to sail in and out. So it allows him to keep a larger fleet off Brest. Knights of Everyone, with the amount of reading you do on naval history, if you can't think of a, a suitable operation of the type of moment that it requires in the war, in the, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars to basically World War II for the Royal Navy to maintain a fleet at sea, or do it carrying out long-term blockade duty, the odds are there isn't one. And that means that's why they didn't maintain it. They kept still, they still had replenishment ships going around, but they were replenishing their ports and moving the supplies between the supplies between the ports. Now, Hawk can manage to maintain a close blockade of the French. And he'd done this by keeping on a constant cycle of ships going backwards and forwards. So at usually at any one point, there are three ships going back and three ships coming to, and three or four ships three or four ships going back, three or four ships coming in Plymouth, three or four ships coming back. 
going to Plymouth Torbay, etc. But the trouble was, in the first week of November, there's a westerly gale. And after three days, the ships of Hawke's blockade are forced to run for Torbay on the south coast of England. Because the, 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 the gale is just so strong. They lead, leave Captain Robert Duff behind in, uh, with his inshore squadron. And it's a squadron of 550s uh, and nine frigates to keep an eye on the transports in Quiveron Bay. And... You, thanks to this movement, a small squadron from the West Indies actually managed to join the French commander, the fleet commander, Conflance, who is in Brest. And when an easterly wind comes off on the 14th, and this is the point, in getting in and out of Brest, you need winds from a certain direction. Conflance slipped out. He was sighted by HMS Acton, which had managed to remain off sta a station off Brest despite the storms, but she failed to rendezvous with Hawke. She was si uh, he was sighted by Juno and Swallow, which tried to warn Duff but were chased off by the French. He was also spotted by the Victualler, which was one of the supply ships the British had out trying to supply their fleet. Remember what was said about the ships returning to be cleaned, etc., but also a constant flow of supply ships coming down and going back with fresh supplies. And they'd often come down in co with the ship's line coming down, so they'd be protected. Love and Unity was actually returning from Quiberon, sighted the French fleet at 2pm on the 15th, 70 miles west of Belle Isle. She managed to meet Hawk the next day, and gave Hawk the warning of where they were. And Hawk basically crams on every scrap of sail he can and sails his fleet for Quiberon Bay. So the thing is, they are, in the first week of November, after three days of some of the worst storms that have been recorded in history, Hawk's squadron has been forced to go back to Torbay. Not to Plymouth, they've been forced to Torbay by the weather. He's already back on station, heading back on station on the 15th. So within days, he's back on station. He's gone to Torbay, he's waited for the weather to calm down a bit, and then he's gone straight out. And he can do that because the ships are already supplied, because the ships already have good sailors on them, because he doesn't need to do anything in port. He just needs to get out to sea. Here is the good news, though. HMS Vengeance arrives in Quiberon Bay the night before Conflans does and manages to warn Duff, so he manages to put his sea out to sea, his squadron out to sea in the teeth of a west northwesterly gale in order to avoid being caught in Quiberon Bay between the French ships there and Conflans fleet coming in. Conflans slows down on the 19th of November and arrives at Quiberon at dawn. 20 miles off Belle Isle, he sights seven of Duff's squadron. He realises quite quickly this is not the main British fleet, and so he gives orders to chase. Very, very smart, you know, that's the thing. You see the French British fleet, the small ones, chase them. He splits his ships to the north and south, with a French van in the centre and in pursuit whilst the rear guard held off to windward to watch some strange sails appearing from the west. Um, the French were therefore very scattered when Hawke's fleet comes into sight. HMS Magnum E sights the French at 08.30 hours, and Hawke gives the signal for line abreast. Not in line, line abreast. Conflans at this point realises he has a choice. He can fight in his disadvantageous position in the high seas with a, to use the French phrase, very violent west northwesterly wind. To use the British phrase, uh, it was mildly problematic. 
but by this point, of course, you've got a fleet which has been sitting off Brest for most of the year. They are used to weather by this point. The French fleet has been sitting inside of Brest. So his choice is to fight in the west northwesterly wind or try to take up a defensive position inside Quiberon Bay and dare Hawk to come in after him. Again, I will ask you all, and I, I know there's the turtle of the battle here, so it kind of tells you, but does anyone think daring Hawk was a good idea? That Conflans was not thinking, hang on, I'm against Admiral Hawk, who has already done some pretty nutty and risky things. So daring him to come and attack me, he's going to come in and attack me. So it's not so much a dare. It's a statement. It's, he's going to do it. Now, at this point, well, 0900 hours, Hawk gives this signal for General Chase, his favourite signal when he sees the enemy, General Chase, uh, along with a new signal that would tell the first seven ships to form line ahead, uh, in spite of the weather and, well, well, dangerous waters, set full sail in order to make their way in. By 1430 hours, Conflans had rounded Le Cardinot, the rocks at the end of the Quiberon Peninsula, that gave the battle its name in French. And as he did so, HMS Warspite fires the first shots. Oh, night six eight. Nightbot, stop being cruel to. Yes, you see, that, that you did the multiple explanation marks. No, and, and I said, Nightbot doesn't like multiple exclamation, exclamation, ex exclamation marks. Please note, as I said though, HMS Warspite fires the first shot. Why am I saying HMS Warspite fires the shot, not anyone else? Well, because Captain John Bentley, Sir John Bentley, claimed that they were fired without his orders. And the crew who loaded the guns claimed they did not set them off. So... The crew claimed they didn't set off the guns, and we must trust them. And the captain didn't give orders for the guns to be set off. So the only option is, HMS Warspite fired her own guns. What's worse is that it's, we're fairly certain that these cannonballs actually hit a French ship. So yes, this is the battle where we have uh, uh, possibly our first conclusive proof that with HMS Warspite goes a spirit which is ardently desiring to get it right ne near to the enemy. That has never understood a phrase of distance. Now, the real problem for uh, Conflans was at this point, not only had he failed, he decided he was going to fight inside Quiveron Bay, but he actually failed to get inside in time because the British were actually overtaking the rear of the French fleet, even as their van and centre made it to the safety of the bay. So the French fleet is now being forced to fight piecemeal. At 1600 the hours, the uh, French vessel, the Formidable, surrendered to the Resolution. This was surrender took place just as Hawk himself, in his flagship, rounds the Cardinals. Now, please note... Conflans, the name of Conflans flagship is once again the Solil Royal, and she's the third ship of that name. The British ships, well, there's the Royal George, 100 guns, under Sir Edward Hawke. There's the Union, under a flagship of Sir Charles Hardy. 
There is the Duke, the Namur, the Mars, the War Spite, 74 guns, of course. Torbay, under the command of Augustus Keppel. Uh, Magnamy, under the command of Viscount Ho, who would later on be Admiral of the Fleet Richard Ho. First Earl Howe, uh, that's O-H-H-O-E-W-E. -E. Uh, Resolution, Hero, Swiftsger, uh, Dorsetshire, Burford, James Gambier, the Burford under command of James Gambier, who of course is a future commander of the Western Squadron. Um, there is Temp HMS Temple, who's under the command of Cap the then Captain Washington Shirley, who would later go on to become Vice Admiral Washington Shirley, 5th Earl of Ferrers. Um, then we have HMS Falkland, under the command of Sir Francis Samuel Drake. We also have the Rochester, under Robert Duff. The Portland are uh, under Marriott Abuffnot. Uh, the Dunkirk under Robert Digby. The Montague under Joshua Storley. The jo uh, Revenge under the command of John Storr. Um, the Intrepid under Jervis Malveson. Uh, the Defiance under Patrick Baird. The Vengeance under, Ga uh, under Gamalin Nightingale. Uh, the Saphir under John Strachan. The Minerva under... Admiral, well, the, the, at this point, the merely Captain Alexander Hood would go on to become Admiral Alexander Hood and first Viscount Bridport. Yes, please note again, the guy who ends up commanding the um, Western Squadron from, the, from 1795 to 1800. Um... Venus under Thomas Harrison, Maidstone under Dudley Diggs, and Coventry under Francis Belsom. There's a few more ships as well. I think I've forgotten this, but, you know. There is... Did I mention Hercules under William Fortescue? Uh, the, 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 it's basically, it is not a good force for you to be letting in close quarters with you. Yes, I am funking my disc a lot. I will stop thumping it. I know, no doubt worries people. Um... At this point, Kersin attempts to come to the aid of Confluence, but Tezere, Tezere uh, performed her turn without closing her bar points. Now, Kersin, um, Tezere is a 74-gun ship of the line in the second division under Guy Francois de Kersin, and he attempts to come to save his cap his admiral in the Soli Royal. Unfortunately. He doesn't close his lower gun ports when he's trying to do a radical turn. Water rushed into the gun deck and she capsizes with only 22 survivors. Can't think where that's happened in history famously before. Um, the Superb also capsized, and the badly damaged Heros struck her flag to Viscount Howe before running aground on the foreshold during the night. At this point, even the weather turns out to be against Confluence. Either that or Warspite has controlled the weather along with her name, because the wind shifts from uh, west northwest to northwest. Which starts to really break up Confluence's half-formed line as they tried to face Hawks uh, against Hawks' pursuit. Uh, Confluence keeps trying to resolve the muddle, but in the end decides his only option is to try and put to sea again. Solid Royal heads for the entrance just as Hawk comes in on the Royal George. Now... Just imagine this, the Solid Royal is go trying to get out the sea, and Hawks in uh, on the Royal George, on the on the bri on the sort of the main deck, in charge, going There's the enemy admiral! There's my counterparts! Okay. At this point Hawk decides to go straight for the Solid Royal, but and try and rake up. But the Intrepide, that wonderful ship sent to protect Confluence, 
interposes herself between the Royal George and the Solid Royal and takes the fire. At this point, the Solid Royal had actually fallen to leeward and is forced to run back and anchor off Crozac, away from the rest of the French fleet. So at this point, Confluence has, has lost all ability to command his fleet. Most of them aren't even sure where he is. And by about 1700 hours, darkness had fallen, so Hawk makes the signal to anchor. Carry on fighting by longboat. During the night, eight of the French ships managed to actually successfully navigate through the shoals to the safety of the open sea. They're doing this solo. They are not waiting for Solio Royal. They're not waiting for any orders. They're trying to escape. Seven, and they make it to Rochefort. Uh, seven of the ships and frigates w managed to position themselves in the Valenian S3. It's a lovely place. It's a, it's a beautiful place to get themselves positioned in. However, to they can't, the British can't attack them in the stormy weather uh, because of the sandbars and because of the difficulty of getting that inshore. And the French decide to jettison their guns and gear and use the rising tide and north left was the wind to escape over the sandbar. Now, one of these ships is actually wrecked in the process and the remaining six are trapped throughout 1760 by the British squadron and only managed to break out and reach Brest in 1761-62 in sort of December, January. So um, basically they're as good as off the board. The Juiced uh, is lost as she's made for Loire. Only 150 crew of her crew survived. And unfortunately, during the night, HMS Resolution actually grounds on Foreshoal herself. Now, the Soli Royal tries to escape to the safety of the batteries at Crozac. But um, HMS Essex pursues her. They are both wrecked on the shoal besides Heros. And on the 22nd, the gale moderated, and Duff's frigates, three of Duff's frigates, are sent in to destroy the beach ships. Confluence actually sets fire to the Royal himself, but the British burn Heros. This is the result of the battle. The British start off with 24 ships of the line and 5 frigates. The French with 21 ships of the line and 6 frigates. The results of the battle are in. The British, 2 ships of the line wrecked, 400 killed. The French, 6 ships of the line destroyed, 1 ship of the line captured, 2,500 killed. Family, also some French ships were named for various interesting people. Um, but, yes, yeah, so... <sighs> yeah, the French lost a lot of ships in this battle. Fought in one of the most violent storms that there's ever been a battle fought in at sea. It's interesting to note that um, Resolution, of course, had managed to capture an enemy ship. So while she herself gets destroyed by a shoal and lost, she's already captured a French ship. And Resolution was a 74 gun. And um, she captured, uh, Resolution's captured an 80 gun. So, basically, what happens is HMS Resolution goes, right, then I'm going to go, be completely dangerous in this battle. But just to make sure that if anything happens, uh, I have been replaced in the Royal Navy, I will capture an 80 gun. And it'll be called HMS Formidable. Which is quite important because Formidable becomes a very important name for the Royal Navy down the years. There's an aircraft carrier name for her in World War II. Um... Please note, the Royal George did manage to sink some ships. It sank the Superb 
and it sank a few other, a couple of others as well. It, you know, the Royal George Hawk was not, did not, uh, Hawk was not the man with his sword drawn going, this will be victorious today, going, oh, they've all managed to run away from me. No, he did manage to catch some. Finding my longboat, like with swords? No, longboat is literally the long... Well, yes, with swords, but they would take muskets, etc., and then longboats, and they try and sneak up on the French ships in the dark, row up to them, and try and board them. There was all sorts of fun stuff going on. Whenever whenever the British is sort of anchored in night fighting, you, you go to some really nasty methodologies. It was not really that popular to do that in the storm, but, yeah. And um, there are some really interesting paintings and his memorabilia of the Royal George uh, put out there. For some reason, I think the only ship name for the Battle of Quiberon Bay was HMAS Quiberon, Quiberon, which served with the Australian Navy during World War Two. Yeah. Launched the Q-class destroyer. And pre dread on the torpedo. Yeah, but you know, the carrier's more interesting than well. However, I don't want you going away thinking that the Western Squadron is always, always victorious. That the British just go to sea and they automatically win. Because, as much as I would love to say that, because, you know, as a British person, it would be gorgeous to be able to say that, uh, it's not always the case. Occasionally you have indecisive battles and occasionally you have French victories. Unfortunately, this is the Battle of Ushant and... Um, in this battle, the British have 29 ships in line, and the French have 30 ships in line. The British suffer roughly three, well, I would say three times as many killed as the French. They lose 407 to 126. And wounded, they suffer almost twice as many, 789 to 413. Now... In this battle, Admiral Keppel is commanding from HMS Victory. Now, the background of the battle is interesting, and that's why it's usually considered indecisive rather than a French victory, because... And the 20th, sort of the French fleet sort of outnumbered the British to start with. The um, Keppel sighted the French fleet west of Ushant, and that's the fleet under Comte de Oliviers, on noon of the 23rd of July. The French immediately tried to sort of get out the way. And Keppel sort of is immediately trying to pursue them. And around 7 o'clock in the evening, the French fleet went about and began heading towards the British. Keppel didn't want to fight at night. So he hove to his ships in response. In the morning of the 24th, Dothers found himself in the northwest of the British fleet and cut off from Brest. So he retained the weather gauge. Though. But what happened is two of his ships managed to escape into Brest. And Keppel and him spent three days sort of shadow boxing with Orville's declining action and maintaining his position upwind and heading into the Atlantic. Now, at 6 a.m., or 0600 hours, Occasionally you do have a bang. 0600 hours on the 27th of July. The British fleet were found to be in line abreast. 
Keppel gave then the order for the rear division, which was under Sir Hugh Palliser. Now, the point is, Sir Hugh Palliser, Keppel was from the other side of the political dividing line. Okay, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, at this point, by this point, British had, the British had tried to reach a point where you didn't get promoted or given commands on where, depending on what side of the political line you were, you were given the commands based on being the best for the job. And Keppel was felt to be the best for the job. So being given command. But what they've done is they balance out by giving him a second in command who was from the other side of the political line. And it was also, they'd been very good friends for the last 40 years. So despite being from the different sides of the political line, they were good friends. This is important to remember. Now, this second in command is Hugh Palliser. Who had in many ways had to act as an intermediary between Keppel and the, the government administration at the time. Because Keppel could be a bit strange with them. Now, Keppel gives the order for Palliser to chase to windward at 0600 hours on the 27th of July. At 0900 hours, the French, who previously been sailing in the same direction, several miles to windward, went about at once. As the rearmost ships of the French fleet were tacking, the wind changed, though, and this allowed the British to close the gap between them and their quarry. They managed to get closer to the French fleet. At 10.15 hours, the British are therefore find themselves slightly to leeward, lying ahead on the same course as the French. A further change in wind brought about a nice spot of rain, which cleared up by 1100 hours. And then there was another change in wind direction to the southwest, which gave the advantage to the British. Orvels immediately sought to negate this by ordering ships about. The French were now heading towards the British in a loose formation and passed slightly to windward. The French ships were a few points off the wind, just a few. And Orvels orders them to be close hauled so they can get closer to the wind so they can get the maximum speed from the wind. This caused the French to veer slightly away from the British. The battle begins at 11.20 hours. Now remember the earlier battle, early orders given to Palliser. When the fourth French ship in line was able to bring her guns to bear. Keppel saved his salvo. He was saving his salvo for the enemy flagship. So he was his flagship, Keppel's ship. And this is why I wouldn't want to serve under Keppel myself. Just... No, on HMS Victory, as we said. Which, by the way, Keppel was not only aboard, he also had John Campbell as his first captain, who was a rear admiral, and John F Jonathan Falconer as his second captain aboard, because he had a fleet captain and he chose on a rear admiral for it. Keppel was a bit of an egotist. Anyway, um, Keppel decides he's not going to fire at those six ships. So he's taken six broadsides before he starts that he actually fires. And it's only when he gets in the range of the 110-gun Bretagne, he engages the Bretagne and fires at him. And then he fires at the next ships, ships in the French line. He could have fired six broadsides. He could have fired broadsides all the way along. But no, he holds his broadside because I'm not going to fire till I fire on the French Admiral. I, just seems stupid. Um, I could just imagine Nelson going, you know what, or Hawk going, you know what, I will wait to fire till I am actually sure I'm with the French and the enemy admiral. Or, I have a lot of guns. That ship doesn't, I don't care, that's an enemy ship. I'll put, sh I will start firing at it. Now, as the British van under Robert Hardland, um, passed the head of the French line, Harland ordered his ships about so as to chase the French rearguard including the Sphinx. Palace's ten ships at the rear hadn't managed to form up a, a form line of battle. They were still in loose irregular formation, because remember, earlier they'd been ordered to chase, so they got out of formation and got spread about. And Palace's division is therefore badly mauled. 
And because it's mauled, it all gets damaged. And so it's being attacked in piecemeal. At 1300 hours, Victory passes the last French ship and attempts to follow Harland around. But she's been so dam badly damaged in her mass and rigging that Keppel has to wear around and it's 1400 hours before his ships were on the opposite tack. It's at this point that Palliser in Formidable manages to emerge from the battle downwind of, downwind of Keppel's division. Now think about that. Keppel has been trying to fight as best he can in a loose formation and still assist. I mean, Palliser has been trying to fight as best he can in a loose formation and still assist. Meanwhile, and he's been definitely been fighting. So he's no, there's no argument of cowardice here. He's been fighting. But his ships are damaged. Keppel's ship is so damaged, Victory's so damaged, it takes, it takes him an hour to turn round. The French line tacked at this point, and we're now heading south on the starboard tack and trying to pass the British, uh, British fleet to leeward. The French were following through their practice of firing high into the rigging, which had left several British ships disabled. And at this point, Keppel now tries to stand towards the French fleet trying to get away, making the signal forming line of battle. By 4 p.m., Harlan, that's 1600 hours, Harlan's division had gone about and joined Keppel's in line. But Palliser hadn't. He either wouldn't, couldn't, or get his ships, or misunderstanding Keppel's intentions, the, the, his ships formed line with their commander, which was several miles upwind from the rest of the British fleet. Orville's did not attack the British, though. He. While it was divided into three sections, and instead he continued his course to get away. He didn't. This is the point at which the French priority of survival and mission over victory really becomes apparent because he's got the British fleet divided in three. He could start defeating them in turn. He doesn't. It's at this point that Keppel, at uh, 1700 hours, that Keppel sends the sixth rate, HMS Fox, to demand Palliser join his rest of the fleet and. When this failed, at 1900 hours, Keppel sends an order removing Palliser from the chain of command by ind and ind starts individually signaling each ship of Palliser's division. By the time those ships join up with Keppel, night had fallen, and using the darkness, the French fleet sailed off. By daylight, the French were 20 miles away and there was no chance of attacking them, of catching them. Now, when the French got home, they have issues because one of their admirals goes to Paris, reports it a victory, and then, of course, it's found that, you know, it wasn't a victory. And the captains of Alexandra, Duc de Bourgogne, Temerin, and Brochefort were all subjected to inquiry for failure to take part in battle because they got separated from the fleet in the night of the 23rd to 24th of July. In Britain, we have what's known as the Palliser Keppel affair. And this is quite simple. And how do I put this politely? Well, Now, the official public dispatch from Keppel commended all his officers for their countless in action. 
Tor said how great they were. The trouble is, Keppel also decides to attack him in private. And he sends notes to his nephew. And his nephew publishes these notes. So, Keppel's political friends begin a campaign of calumny. They claim that Palliser deserted him. And if it wasn't for Palliser, Keppel would have won a great victory. If it wasn't Palliser's fault. Um, the ministerial papers are then leaked in the same side. Because remember, Palliser comes from the ministerial side. And the result is debates in Parliament and both get court-martialed. Keppel is tried first and acquitted. And then Palliser is also tried and acquitted. Keppel gets no further posts at sea. He does become First Lord of the Admiralty in 1782. But he gets no further posts at sea. Because, frankly... He's not trusted by anyone, not even his own people, his own side. Palliser, well, Palliser is court-martialed, and his censure is that he failed to inform his superior officer of the battle damage in a timely manner, because it's found his ship was so damaged, that's why he couldn't do anything. Um, after his acquittal, he is appointed governor of Greenwich Hospital by Lord Sandwich. He's promoted to full admiral. And he doesn't again so at sea. But he is one of the patrons of James Cook. And that is why you have Cape Palliser and Palliser Bay and Palliser Isles in Australia. And after Cook's death, Palliser erects a memorial to Cook at his estate in Charlford and St Giles in Buckinghamshire. Honestly, both got taken up by politics, but... It was a political battle, and it was a stupid battle which should have taken place. Please note also, the Battle of Ashant has come up many times, and I am going to take the time to shamelessly point this out, but we are now four hours. This video has been going four hours long, and it wasn't supposed to be four hours. Um, it was supposed to be three. And it is, if you consider, the my favourite Battle of Ashant, of course, is one which involves tribal class destroyers in 1944. And again, you will find that mentioned in my book. You will find that mentioned in my book, very happily so. But there's the glorious 1st of June, which will be talked about later this year, which is going to be the only schedule, a live scheduled for, uh, for June. There's going to be many lives in June, but the only one I've currently scheduled is the glorious 1st of June, because if the plans that will hopefully be unveiled this week go through, then I'm going to be very busy in June. It is really going to, I have to admit though, the plans, and I'm going to emphasise this, especially with what's happened with um, the lovely university, uh, it really is dependent upon all your support, it actually being possible. Four hours is not a problem. Four hours it just means it's 11 o'clock at night in my time. And also because I'm not sure how many people like to watch a four hour long live of my videos. Anyway. It feels like a long lecture, because normally my lecture seminars are roughly two hours. There's also the action of 6th of October 1779, the action of 10th of August 1780, the Battle of Ashant 1781, the Battle of Ashant 1782, and yeah, so there has been, um, how do I put this, seven battles of potentially called Battles of Ashant. It's one of those Spectre Edo spaces which is just rich in battle terminology. This is the modern port of Brest. The modern naval facility. 
you can see the still surviving U-boat pens. Brest is a strategic decision of the French. And it's an understandable one. But the problem is, the British put in so much support into generating a support in the Western Squadron. The French never do the same with Brest. You know, as I mentioned earlier when talking about Brest and its timeline, the fact is, the railway line, the canal, all the things which would allow them to supply it in to a decent level are not completed till the middle of the 19th century. Those things were needed earlier. I need a vi and someone needs a microphone web a vibration isolator. Sorry. I will try I tried to stop myself doing it, but you know. It's it's one of those cool things, but it's also a problem. With breast, because it's cool because the French are actually investing in naval affairs, but they're not investing wisely. They've got to build an Atlantic fleet. They have got to have a fleet that can challenge the channel. And Brest is the best one for that. The trouble is... You also need to sustain it to do it. The Brest is... Uh, there is no real fertile land around it to actually sustain the population they want to build in it. They need to, to do it to get it to work. You know, you can see, if we go back to this map, you can see the modern roads. You can see the modern road system. But there's also a railway. There was also a canal built. And these things just about start to deal with its demand. But the fact is, when you start building a base, you need to think about those things. You need to think, hang on. If we are a naval base and we are dependent entirely on bringing our supplies by sea, what is the reality going to be for us? I've tried. I've got him one of those Lanyard microphones. The trouble is, Paul, the Lanyard microphone and the computer system doesn't always get on with it. And... I still do have the big thing which hangs over but I haven't got a place which actually will work it from because I tried to put it up on the roof and it didn't work. But those are microphone topics are off discussion. If you want to we'll discuss them on Discord after this. The trouble is, and I'll be in the general chat for a bit this week. Probably not a full hour but probably I'll do half an hour in there just to chat away. The problem is with all of this, it, it, there's no point doing half measures in infrastructure. That's the point. When you look at the development of Plymouth, when you look at the development the British are shoving there to support the Western Squadron versus the amount of money going to, the, uh, to Brest, you start to realise very quickly there is one nation for whom this naval, this naval power is an absolute necessity and there is another nation for whom it's a would like to have. And that's the real point for the French. They find themselves fighting global manoeuvre wars, strategic level manoeuvre wars, against the naval power, for whom naval power is not a choice. If it was the French versus the Spanish, they would have been evenly matched, because for both of them, naval power is a choice and land power is a necessity, because they can fight each other on land, but they would be evenly matched. For the British, naval power is not a choice. And this period, it just isn't. You have to have it. And when you consider how many times the French plan to invade from this region, using the fleet at Brest, using the fleets coming around, you suddenly start to realise the Western Squadron is there for a reason. The purpose of the Western Squadron, very simple, is if anything gets 
to the point at which there is an enemy fleet in strong enough force at Brest or in that region to engage it, fight it, and preferably win against it. But if necessary, do so much damage to it, it cannot continue. A kill is preferable, but a mission kill will do. U-boat pens took so much larger quantity explosives to remove the Allies decided to try to stop trying after Germany surrendered. Yeah, pretty much. Don't think even the French have tried to really get rid of them. They've just looked at them and gone, we try. At several points they've tried. So that's the story of Brest. The story of Brest is the story of the Western Squadron. And as, you know, if we go back to this timeline, for it, sitting there back here, every time Britain has a war or is a, looking at a point where they're worried about the French, the Western Squadron gets stood up. And eventually the Western Squadron becomes the Channel Squadron. But the Channel Squadron's duties remain the same. Brest is still the main target and the main worry. The bases on the Atlantic coast are what the British worry about because the bases on the Atlantic coast can build the large ships, can supply the fleets and supply the numbers. So what have we got coming up? Well, uh, this week we have, on the 30th of March, and it will be the 30th of March, and I will make sure because this week my sister's away, so I'm doing all the cooking. So we're fine. <laughs> fine. Nothing's happening this week. Uh, there is Brew Ships 107 tomorrow, which is already scheduled and has already some of the books listed. Some of the books listed. There will be other books added to it. Um, on the 30th of March, there is the Patreon bonus, which is going to be Carl von Gasberg's Reichsmarine and Kriegsmarine eschews steam and goes all diesel. Electric propulsion. Um, the Patreon bonus, because when I looked back over it, it gets a consistent roughly 12 to 14 depending on the time, but sometimes the lower seven, but usually between 12 and 14 votes. Uh, I decided, as he's put it in about a dozen times, that adds up to an aggregate of a lot of votes. Basically, I was going by aggregate of how many Peter Hill people have consistently voted for this and just going, see who's got number large numbers, and it was that has won. So that's the patron bonus for March. And then we have the Key Ship series in April. They're going to be not live. They're going to be recorded videos because I'm off wandering. And then we have... 9th of April, Patron 76. Because I'm back. And 12th of April, Brew Ships 108. 6th of April, Patron 77. So the patron vote, uh, patron suggestions will go live tomorrow, and the patron vote will go live while I'm wandering. I don't think my sister is really poisoning me for cooking. I'm just glad I'm cooking this week. I will be blunt at the start of that March thirtieth. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting because, you see, if you start off with them all going all diesel and <laughs> you're having to go everything diesel, so I'm looking at diesel destroyers, diesel everything, it starts to make a lot of changes. <laughs> it's interesting. It, you have to make a lot of the differentials. It's also going to cause trouble because whilst theoretically you can have access to more fuel, it does put you in more direct competition with certain other sections of the German economy. So it's going to be an interesting one. Right, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Colin Cameron, and... Um, I'm 
sure there was another super chat somewhere around here, but I've, I can't find it. Thank you, Colin Cameron. And um, I, I would, if I could say, if find out a super chat, I would say so. Thank you. Thank you, John Luke, for becoming a supporter. Thank you, everyone who supports and uh, supports the channel and does super chats and is members and all those things and just subscribes to the channel, likes the videos, shares the videos. It really helps, and it's going to sound terrible to say this again, but because I spent far too long at the beginning talking about this, but it is, you are, seriously, YouTube and Patreon, without you, I would be in um, very, very bad waters. I would be in very in a lot of trouble, thanks to basically the system. I, I certainly wouldn't be a historian anymore. I, I couldn't afford to be. I would have had to go and either work for. Uh, it's, it sounds terrible. It's going to sound terrible because I, I don't have anything wrong with. There's nothing wrong with working for a bank or working for something else like that, but that's not what I want to do. I, I like to be a historian. I like to look up the story. That's that's my dream. So that's what I'm trying to do, but it's a case of. Yeah. Without your support, it wouldn't be viable. Thank you, Jack Ray. And, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be a fun one. And it'll be a fun one on... It'll be a fun one on the 30th of March. It will be. And, of course, that one will come out on the... That, the recorded version at... <laughs> will come out on the uh, Saturday. Um, so I might well sh shove the key ship series might well begin on the 31st. Because that's on the 1st. And the 31st I might make, I might make that so I can add in something else in the next week in the, in the key ship series. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Byron Newman. Thank you, Vision. Thank you, Reparator Zach. Thank you, Tanya Felica. Thank you, Josh Funk, Amelia Barrow, Matthew Meek, Mark Harkness, Paul Beswick, and the Rapid Razorback. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Frame 15. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you, Ains Morrison. DG40. Alzaski. Thank you. Melly6040. Thank you. Night6081. Thank you. Bijan, of course. Thank you. Um, Rapid Razorback. Thank you. George Newman. Thank you. Paul from Chicago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nightbot, for doing what you do. Thank you, Tanif. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Thank you, Inns Morrison. Thank you, Seneca Nero. Uh, thank you, Alzaski. Thank you, Megascro. Thank you, John Thank you, Frank Bramwell. H. Transfer done. Harry P. Thank you. And yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. You really do make a difference. I'm not getting into it. Uh, not getting into it before. Uh, I can't remember. I will have to uh, be hard pressed to come up with another good, consistently attractive patron question. <laughs> yes, you basically you've worn down the patrons by just keep uh, by asking the same question. It it does give people perhaps a methodology. Uh, no, because I was told many years ago that if I wanted to get a tenured post, I needed to change my specialism because, you know, there's no point in studying naval history. To quote one person in an interv interview, and it was after the interview was over, you know, really, there's no point in studying naval history. There's never going to be another war or anything at sea, so there's no point studying it, really. You're cute. <sighs> Interesting university, that one is. Take care, Aaron. Thank you for watching. And this is... Next week we have... Navigators. From shores to satellites. So that's also coming up during the Key Ship series. And we also... No, well, next week we actually have... We have Ironclad, Frigates of the Line. Which you're going to enjoy. You will do. Thank you for watching, everyone. And I hope you've had a nice day. And a nice time.